everybody good evening welcome to another wonderful entertaining motor age tst webinar as always i'm pete meyer and of course here with my good friend g trolia welcome on this hot day you think you're in florida again right <laughs> lucky it's air conditioned in here right <laughs> yeah yes and, and, and actually it's pretty nice up here because they don't have the humidity that we usually have at least not today yeah. anyway well for him there's no humidity yeah. for me this is very humid. Yeah, I'm right at home <laughs> right at home here and that just makes up for the last few times I've been here. That's uh, it. He did put up with the cold. <laughs> now he has the heat, 90 plus degrees uh, out there. So, so anyway, hey, uh, we appreciate you coming out and joining us tonight. Uh, we know that you have a lot of choices in what you'd be doing, especially on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. So we're glad that you made the choice to be here with us today. We hope that we uh, make that choice or, or reinforce that choice, not a waste of your time. We certainly want to do that. But as always, we're just trying here to help. Uh, help give you some new information resources that the uh, bottom line is will help you become more efficient in what you do help you take better care of your families put a little more money in the bank uh, that's what it's all about right so that's why yep. we're here it's about helping yeah absolutely. and learning right we yeah. learn by the way if you have something that may be of interest to us maybe you know we don't know everything put something in the chat yep and, and uh, we'll uh, share we, it we can go take care of that right off the bat uh, of course like as they always a little homework uh, a little housework to do before we get started uh, you're of course you're watching us on your motor race training account page and you're looking probably at the chat window uh, to the right side of that player you can put your questions comments there and yep. uh, we will see a whole lot of people already clicking on online good evening everybody um and and use it for that you know uh, i i don't hate to say this but if you start getting off tangent and it starts to detract from why we're here um, then we're going to have to pull the plug on you. We don't want to do that. You know, we want to encourage a free share of ideas. But same token, we're here to help one another learn and to make the most valuable use of our time that we can. Um, and when you sign in and you go to your account page, you should have noticed that uh, right below the uh, listing where you click on to actually launch this, this program, uh, that when you're done, you can click out a certificate of completion. Uh, that also counts for you educators to your continuing education credits. Uh, we don't have a handout for you to download at, the, at the, right this time, but I'll give you some information where you can email uh, me and I'll make sure that you get a copy of the slides that we go through tonight. We want to spend more as much time fooling with the actual vehicle as we do on the PowerPoint, right? So, right. So what do you say we get started and give a big thank you to the folks at Snap-on, specifically their Fast Track Intelligent Diagnostics. They're the sponsors of tonight's webcast. As you've heard Gene and I say many times before, if it wasn't for these sponsors, we wouldn't be able to bring this information and content to you at no cost to you guys and gals. So uh, we all, as, as with all of our sponsors, you know, show them a little love, you know, let them know that you appreciate it. Yep. And, and you can go to see them at uh, snapon.com. Uh, just Google snap-on diagnostics and uh, get a view of all the fine diagnostic products and snap-ons we've yeah. for many, many years. And it is super helpful that these sponsors help us to help all of you. That's the biggie. And by the way, we use Snap-on in the shop as well. So we can tell you, you know, it does work very well. Oh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Snap-on's been a, um, in the business forever. That I, I mean, I, I, I know as long as you and I have been. You bet. Right? And my toolbox the, is the a big Snap-on mausoleum that I'm going to throw my fat ass yeah. in when I die. It won't need anything else. <laughs> it's the big old, enough the old snap on brick <laughs> right the, i had the brick and every every snap um, on you know diagnostic piece of equipment and, uh, tonight a little later on we'll be making uh, use of the new zeus the newest zeus yep. uh, we can share that with you but again thanks to snap on for making Thank this you. happen um now i'm going to give you this to, to you twice i wanted to bring this up at the beginning and near the end we always let you know that if you have a question or or something comes up after the the, the tonight's a webinar that you uh, pops into your head you want to ask a question or comment please make note of these email addresses for myself and let's see him in there there he is i got it right this time too you're right? good last, right last for, time he sent you to some site i don't even want to talk about you know? <laughs> for my friend g um <laughs> and not just that but offer us your critiques comments what do you want to see what yeah. topics would you like us to cover uh, so that we can make sure that we work on those things for you, what you want most, okay? Yeah. Again, your input is super important. So let's start off with the next topic, following uh, uh, professional diagnostics, attacking especially milk-related uh, concerns. 
and following a process to make that happen. So that's where we kind of want to start tonight is talking about the process. You know, I've watched a lot of good techs struggle with any kind of diagnosis, let alone a, a DTC or drivability problem, because they weren't following a process. Right. Or as I call it, and you read many of my articles as my editor, a game plan. Yeah. Because see our Yankees doing so well? They got the game plan going. Okay, so they lost the last two. But game plan, if you know where to start that diagnostic approach, you're going to be good. But if you're going to go float all around and go, well, the last vehicle, Pete, that came in that was like this Jeep had this problem. You may be throwing a part at the vehicle that is not needed. Yeah. Have a process. And then our common friend, Jim Morton, yep. um, very big on, on diagnostic process, teaching it for years. I love what he says about going with, and we're going to talk about it more later on. But but don't find yourself jumping to an immediate conclusion and going homing in on one little thing, and 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 getting tunnel vision, you know, because you'll find yourself nine times out of ten you're going down a rabbit hole, and and you're just going to get lost and, and just drag on. And the neat thing about a process is that once you have a process to follow and you apply it every single time, every single time the same way, every single time you eliminate that as one of the factors in helping you. Uh, come to a very quick and efficient diagnosis and not just drivability anything on the vehicle that exactly. you have to chase down don't skip different testing procedures don't assume that something is going to be good because you did it the right. brain the eyes the ears the nose the hands important tools along with your scan tool along with your meter along with a scope this is how you're going to diagnose and fix today's problem absolutely problems. and the step number one in that you got to verify the complaint um if you get a chance to talk to the customer to see what their point, you know, what they're experiencing, that's ideal. But you know what? In the real world, nine times out of 10, the driver who's experiencing the problem is not the person bringing it into the shop, right? A lot of times- It may be a significant the, other or a yeah, family member or some sort. Somebody else bringing it in for them and they may not have the information you need. But when I was in the shop full time, I always had the service rider that was kind of the intermediary. And if, and if you're in that same situation, how many times have you got a ticket uh, it says, uh, customer says, engine doesn't run right. <laughs> and that's it. Very vague. Right? And, yeah, extremely vague. So you have no clue what's going on. Uh, so it's really nice to be able to talk to the customer and verify uh, the complaint with them. If you can get them to show you, take a test drive with them and show you what they're experiencing. Of course, this is not assuming we have a mill complaint, but right. any kind of a drivability or, 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 or performance issue. Uh, and well, you know, the big thing there, Pete. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, but no. Interviewing a customer, my techs speak, not only the manager, but the other tech, speak directly with the customer. Because there's nothing worse than you getting it, and then I tell you something, and I'm leaving something out. If you can, and how many of you, when you type the number one in, how many of you out there get to speak to the customer? Real yeah. important to know what their concern is. May not be the light, believe it or not. Okay. Yeah. So, so said, if you're getting to talk to the customer, type a one in the chat box. Yeah, let's, let's see. I'd, I'd like to know how many techs really do that. And if you're in, and, and we don't want to count those who are not, don't want to leave you out. If you're not, type in a number two. Yeah. And we'll see who's who's popular. And besides, gives them finger exercise. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Get used to hitting that, that chat box. Test drive is important, too. And to see how they drive it. Sometimes more than you drive it, sit there as the passenger. We've had people sometimes that have it in second gear and you're like, hey, do you normally right. drive like this? Oh, yeah. Why? You know, or they're too fed of foot driving, one on the brake. That's me. A lot of people do that and uh, it drives me nutty. So I don't know if we could be <laughs> driving with you anymore. But anyway, <laughs> get pairs of combat. Right, well, most of them are one. Good. Oh, I good. love that. Thank you. I'd like to add a little comment. You know, sure. there, there's plausibility on. I saw it in the VW Audi products. If you're a two-footed driver, that thing will shut down on you, give you 15% power or whatever, and you'll think something's wrong with the car. Okay, so Pierre brings up a good point. Uh, plausibility, which is an OBD2 thing that they put in. If you're a two-foot driver on a Volkswagen Audi, that can put it into like a limp-type mode. And that that is common about a lot of these newer vehicles that have intelligent uh, drive per se and information on yeah, board absolutely and then another thing that comes into play with that is how many uh, uh, times have you had a customer that the, the car they're bringing in with a complaint is is you find out it's fairly new to them and it's not what they used to drive so they're not used to how this different vehicle operates and simple things like 
just how to set the AC control. Oh, and it, this it, operate the vehicle systems, and especially nowadays, guys. Tell, take a look at an owner's manual lately. It's like war and peace. Your customers aren't reading that. <laughs> exactly, and you know, you bring a, a point up. This time of year, we get people in air conditioning. It reminds me of this one lady. She had this Mercedes. It wasn't that old. It was, you know, in the 2000s. But her niece used the vehicle. So she knew where the settings were. When the niece changed it, this lady had no clue, thought she had an air conditioning problem. At first, you know, you start to think, wow, is this people trying to pull a fast one on me? The air conditioning wasn't on. She didn't know how to operate the controls. They were on, and she knew only, hey, it works this way. The niece turned something, hit a button. Make sure people understand, hey, this is how something yep. operates, yep. including Absolutely. checking the oil. You know, a little thing I have in there, and you have seen it, the Porsche, where the oil was over full. People need to know, how do I get to that gauge? There's no dipsticks on all the new vehicles. We get a lot of cars, no sticks in here. And there is a procedure. That's where you are, TFI. Read that freaking information to find it. And it's in the owner's manual. That's the important part. It's mm -hmm. there. People just don't look at it. Right, right. And then and, and to that end, and you've heard us say this more and more here, um, the technology that, that you guys and gals are seeing in your bays is just light years ahead of from where when we first started in the business <laughs> and changing almost on a monthly basis. This this could be either one of the most challenging times you've ever faced in your career or most exciting time you've ever faced in your career with these new technologies that are coming. I mean, think about it. You guys and gals are on the verge of a whole new, a whole new view of, right, of, of everything. Of everything, the, the 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 advanced safety systems that are coming out, the EVs that are being being. I mean, I saw a stat the other day, but by the year I want to say twenty thirty. Yeah, twenty. At, yes, twenty thirty is thirty percent of the cars on the road will be EV. Yeah, and by twenty twenty five, the uh, EPA Cafe Corporate Average Fuel Economy. 54 and a half miles a gallon minimal. Yeah. So they're going to electrify vehicles, which they have been doing by adding those big, big AS alternators. So yeah. you got a lithium battery on board yeah. and states like California says 2025, they want full electric. Yeah. And Hey, I, and this is really not really the topic at hand, but I just saw this news release come across my email. National automotive service task force, which we'll talk about more a little mm -hmm. bit later on, uh, announced a, a press release that, Tesla is making their service information available, no charge. And so, yeah, that's really fantastic. Thank you, not. Tesla. Uh, no, so, if I can get your parts, I'd be happy. Yeah. So, there's, I mean, there's a lot more to that than that, but they're, they're, they're really that's a big start. to open up the doors uh, to the automotive aftermarket for servicing your vehicles. And that's there to be applauded for that. Yeah. Anyway, let's go ahead and continue. This is what I like intermittent. It's an intermittent problem. You know, I used to have to deal with this by taking my wife's car into the dealership and uh, we tell them what kind of a problem was and we couldn't duplicate it. So we, we couldn't. Well, it's the easy way out. Pete. It is. Can't duplicate. Yeah. But all I just want to say about intermittents is there's no such thing. An intermittent problem is only one that you have not yet discovered under what conditions that problem occurs. Ah. Once you do, you're going to be able to recreate it whenever you want. That's where the stuff that we talked about earlier comes into play. Observing the driver of the vehicle how they operate. Maybe it's something they're doing that's creating that situation, like, like the double foot operation yeah. that we just talked about. So, but there's always a reason behind it. You just got to find out when that's happening. And let's not forget, go to pro demand and type in there, look for TSBs. Okay. TSBs can be super helpful. Like I have a GMC truck, a new truck. Well, the brakes don't always work. There's a silent campaign. It's not a TSB yet. It should be. But the pedal gets hard because the vacuum pump has an issue and there's an update. So I can do the update since I have the factory tool. Mm -hmm. And most of you have that ability out there with the J25-3040 you can buy from Snap-on to do it. Yep, so there's absolutely. ways to get through absolutely. it. All right, step number two. I always refer to the, the, the during the pandemic, my wife and I would like binge out on Criminal Minds. Good, which is good a, show. A good show, right? It's about the behavioral analysis unit and the FBI. And what really got to me after after we completed the series and we started doing more of these kind of, of webcasts was the similarities. The, the episodes were always different. It's always a different bad guy, different circumstances. 
Same process. But the method they used was the same every single time. And one of the very first things they did was start gathering evidence. So they would go to the crime scene. They would talk to witnesses. They would interview family members. They would talk to the cops on the scene. I mean, canvas the neighborhood. You name it. Everything they could do to gather information about that event. No doubt. Uh, taking the, the pieces that they found and running through all the different scientific tests that they used. All of it. All of it. All of it. It's about gathering information. And what I want to tell you right now is this part of the process is where you need to spend the majority of your time. If you invest the time up front to read up, let's say if you got a mill light on, what causes that code to set? What does the ECM see or not see that is turning that light on to let the driver know there's a problem? We've said this many times before. The ECM itself or any computer on the car itself, dumb as a bag of rocks. They can do nothing on their own. They have to be told what to do. Correct. And then once they get the information that they were told to look at, it's very simple. Engineer says, ECM, when you see this, this, and this, do this. And then there's going to be a follow-up to let you know whether that happened or not. And if you don't see the follow-up, something's wrong. But, Pete, where do I find this area? Maybe that code set and criteria information and service information? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it I may mean, say you have to be engine warm. Or the throttle has to be a certain percentage of APP. And the load has to be something. That's where you find how in the world did they set that DT set. And you, I'm sorry, go ahead. And I'd like to add theory of operation information. Ah. It may not be in the same place. Right. And, and, like, so, and that's why I want to stress, again, especially if you've been in this for a while, there's certain things that we do routinely and and it's just second nature for us anymore but it's also very easy to become complacent as a result of that again you're dealing with some emerging technologies that are changing all the time the way that 18 model gm in your bay does xyz is not the same way that the 08 did or that an audi would do and even it can change from model year to model year in the same manufacturer correct these vehicles now, guys and gals, they don't want to be fixed close. There, there's no gray area when it comes to fixing a car now. Yeah. If yeah. it's either right or it's wrong, and the only way you can avoid making these mistakes is know the enemy. When you do your homework, you understand how that system works on that car in your bay that day. If you've never, ever, ever <clears> seen <throat> that vehicle or performed that test on that specific vehicle, read system you description. You need to read. Like you like to say, RTFI, you need to read the friggin' information so that you know exactly how that works. Don't assume that it works like the one you had in yesterday or the one you have later on in the afternoon. Yeah, because it, it could be it could be very different. Could be very, very different. And these are all good things here. So customer interview, the test drive, the visual, remember the brain, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the hands. Freeze frame. Now we're not talking about the Jay Giles band, the, the song freeze frame. Okay. But freeze frame. <laughs> Is really like I take a picture of Doreen and Pierre over there, and I got it locked. I could see when they moved or how they moved. Well, that information, too many people like hitting the clear code button. Worst thing you can do. Yeah. Do not. You all have one of these, right? You all have a smartphone. And, of course, if you have something like Snap-on, we just hit the button, the S button. We could capture the screenshot and save it, and we give that to the customer. You can see the parameters that this DTC set. You don't want to go racing it up in your bay. Brum, brum, brum. Well, dude, it happened at 30 miles an hour. And it wasn't brum, brum. The load was very low. That's where you duplicate it. This yeah. is the mistake that most techs make. Especially when it comes to drivability. Concerns. Drivability. And yeah. then the mode six, we're going to talk about that in more detail in, in a moment. Okay, But mode six is another part that you absolutely want to go to. And we're also going to demonstrate that in the second half of the webcast for you so you can get a, a real world feel of yeah. what that looks like. And how many use mode six? Type the six in. If not, type a zero. Yeah. Six if you use mode six, zero if you don't. Getting those fingers exercising, right? <laughs> Though you can't fall asleep on us. So, yeah. Uh, so while you're typing those in, mode six for you, use it. Mode uh, zero for you, don't. Step number three, research the facts kind of related to the gathering information phase. But now we're going to go into deeper what that that what we discovered, what that really means. Yep. As you pointed out, number one on the hit parade, check your technical service bulletins. Again, the ECM is dumb as a bag of rocks. The engineer 
programs it for what they expect it to happen in the real world. But they're, they're not going to always hit it right on the money. So there are a number of times where a software update is released to correct some type of issue, whether it's a hiccup in the drivability, maybe it's a transmission shift point, or it could be the reason that a code set or didn't set because of where the test parameters were set or, or established to begin with. You can diagnose all day long, and if that's the case, you're never going to find out. Or and, it's an updated part, like right. you had. Yep. Now, another one I like to bring up, the number one code in the country, P0420, well, that's a common code, and if you didn't read the information, well, you may be working on this particular Toyota or Nissan, and you're going to put a new cat in the car and still have a problem. You shouldn't have done that. You needed to check the cat, make sure the substrate is not broken or clogged, and the fix was to actually update it, a, a software update. Now, think about all the updates. I know my Android phone, coming back from where I was on the road, I had two updates that needed to be done. Okay, same with your Apple or whatever. Windows. Up and window, oh, well, Windows. <laughs> I get sick. And actually, before we put these computers on, yes, they all needed the updates. updates. <laughs> the normal. Right. And again, oh, when we stress to reading up on system operation, we talked about read up on the code setting requirements, talked about that. And any related, now here's the other one flow charts that you get with these codes, they can be valuable tools. Personally, I don't like to use them. I agree. I'm not now, a big flow chart. However, I do like to go through them to see, to get a feel of how that system is working, what the ECM is looking at, what the test pet parameters might be, so that I can create my own tests from that information. Right. If you're following those trouble trees, and I've seen this a million times, I'm sure G and Pierre have too, being shop owners. PCM. <laughs> <laughs> People start it, they get a four-page troubleshoot out, printed out, and they start going down the list, and they get to six, and they go like, oh, I know that's not it. So they're going to skip six and move on to ten, and then they go, um, shoot, I, I'm back from lunch. I forgot where I was. And, okay, here I'm at 20. Well, let's start there. And you end up missing a step. If you miss a step, that's it. You're down the rabbit hole, done, over, game over. You might as well start from scratch again. Or if you make that assumption that there's something that can't be um uh, Rectified well, or found. That's not. <laughs> then you're also going down the rabbit hole, as, as we'll say more. Yes. Can I make a comment? This is my own comment to people, uh, including my uh, ex-apprentice. It is not an a la carte menu. Right. You, you know, don't pick the things that <laughs> very you want good to for you. Test. Right. You do them all in order. Right. And you have to remember who develops these flow charts. These are the junior engineers at the factory who are just getting their their feet wet, uh, and, and they haven't fixed a car in their life. Right. Now, and I got a couple of comments on that. So knowing so many engineers and some of them, like a buddy who retired from both Ford and Volkswagen Audi, um, these guys sometimes make something that is programmed way before the car hits the market. Then something changes. They may change a part on them or something. So a lot of times the service information is not written to where that vehicle came out. It may have been done before time. There's stuff that has to be updated. And guess what? They're not going to be updating that till later on. Yeah. The uh, the other thing is if you don't look at some of these things and, and see that there's, hey, maybe this problem, and I'm going to test it like the flow chart, I'm not going to go down that. Always, my guys have a clipboard with a repair order on it that they can write. Hey, here's what I found. Here's where I left off. You can't leave things to your head. I mean, here we're a small shop. So sometimes someone's going to come in. Hey, I got a problem. I got a flat tire. I got to get on the road. Or I got an air conditioning problem. So you're going to get off the car that someone left us for the day. That's just the way it works. Sorry. Okay. We're going to get that car done because we promised them. But you're not going to work on it continuously. Absolutely. The phone rings. You know, something happens. Like my manager, Bill, his wife had a baby. So he had to leave in the middle of what he was doing. If we didn't know where he was at, if he didn't write something down on the diagnostic he was doing, we're not going to know. we got to start from ground zero, right? All yeah. over again. And another thing I want to point out, too, because we're going to highlight that a little bit more later on, you guys have it made today with the access to this information. You have so many different resources to you, often in the palm of your hand. That very makes true. it very easy for you to find what we're asking you to find. Back in the day, we had to do a lot of digging. 
to, to get that. And even way back in the And day, we had to do we, this. You know yeah. what this is? That was the <laughs> dial phone. <laughs> yeah, no internet. There's no internet. Even dial up. No way. No way. Uh-oh. I thought you'd get a kick out of this. No, I'm not being serious. Here, <laughs> guys, please, don't anybody email my boss or our sponsor that we're advocating this. this but some thing. people <laughs> think. But And not saying, you know, in all honesty, I'm not saying YouTube is a bad thing or Google. They're great. They're great. But you got to know, pick the pepper out of the fly do. Some people are giving you wrong information. You can't go by that. You need a service yeah. information like ProDemand. And we got good things like IATN, Identifix, Diag.net, aftermarket databases, YouTube, Google. Yes, these are all things to look at, but you really do need service information. Right. In other okay. words, as a it, professional, it's vet your resource, vet where the information is coming from. You know, for example, if I go to Identifix or IATN or Diag.net, I know this has been vetted as professional information. And I can take uh, some stock in what's being said. Right. I have no problem going with Google either or YouTube. And we're going to show some examples of some of the aftermarket databases that, that I'm talking about. But you've heard us say this again, time and time again. This is all statistical information. When you get out there and do a search for the problem your customer's having and the code your customer's having, you're going to see all kinds of stuff pop up in the search results. None of that's vetted information. Right. Google's just showing you what's getting the most hits. Exactly. So you don't know how valid that data is. It's still up to you to test your guess, as my buddy Pierre likes to say. Test your test guess. Test your guess. In other words, it's fine to use this information to help give you some guidance in your diagnostic process. It's part of that gathering information phase. But just because 300 people had this, this particular type of problem doesn't mean you're the 301st. You might be. But before you may not. You, well, before you pull the trigger and order that part and charge your customer, verify it first by, test, by testing the component or system that you think is important. Now, that's, that's important. A lot of people just look what's online. And even, you know, ProDemand has a great thing there where you can hit what's the most common on that code. It'll give you the chart and the whole bit. But they're not telling you to replace that component. You have to test it. Does it test out good or bad? Yep. And by the way, you know, the days of the big box scope, that's what I loved about those things. They started with the battery, which is the heart of every electrical system on a car, went through mechanical and all that. Just because you have a mass airflow sensor code, okay, well, if I had a bad valve in the motor, if I had some engine problem, am I going to change that part just because I had a code for it? The answer would be absolutely not. You need to do a complete test of the system. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Again, good for information. Good to help you narrow down or, <coughs> excuse me, clear out your field of suspects as we'll go into. But please don't use it as a shopping list. And I and I and I'll tell you, when you guys and gals that come out and hang out with us on a Saturday, <coughs> excuse me, you know, we know we're preaching to the choir for the most part. But I'm willing to bet that most of you, if you if you could share your stories of the people that you've worked with in the past. You probably know more than one who, who thinks they qualify for that patch. <laughs> <laughs> They've made them. <laughs> Step number four. Again, I want, I want to stress this out. When you're first approaching your diagnosis, no matter what it's on, you know, we're focusing on drivability and mill-related issues tonight, but whatever it's on, never assume that something's okay. Right, because that's the ass out of you and me. That's assume, right. right. Everything, everything is suspect. Uh, I can't. Ex I'm probably not going to quote this exactly right. Spock gets the credit for it, <laughs> but but he isn't the one. It was actually Sir Arthur Conan Doyle who wrote it for his character Sherlock Holmes. When he said something to the effect is, if you if you uh, test or everything that it could be, including the impossible, whatever is left over no matter how improbable, has got to be the problem. Exactly. Right? So that's the thing. What we are teaching here is when you're doing your diagnosis, everything's suspect in the beginning. And what we want you to do is don't worry about trying to narrow in on the problem. Focus more on eliminating everything that it's not. Right. You know, you know like Detective Columbo, just one more thing. Keep asking that question and find that. Yeah. Find yeah. where the problem is. Narrow and again... Down. That was the big thing with always looking and starting with the battery. How many times you can get a high idle, 
from a battery that maybe wasn't registered, okay? And by the way, if you think that's only European, well, they're doing it now on many domestics as well. Simple things sometimes really make a difference on how that vehicle is going to run. Oh, absolutely. So check everything you can. <laughs> All right, on to step number five. As like you said, you start off with everybody suspect, and now you're going to start eliminating those suspects. Again, common mistake is that people will get to directly to pinpoint tests. They'll focus on one little thing and start there when you should be focusing on tests that will help you eliminate as many possible suspects as possible. For example, one of the very first things I do in a drivability is a relative compression test with my scope. It takes a few minutes to perform, and if there are any mechanical defects, nine times out of ten, they're going to stand out right here, right now, unless now, they have an intermittent. Right. Now that's, that's a pretty true fact. Now, there are some things where relative compression won't work. Even a regular compression test won't right. work. Mm -hmm. Well, you need a pressure transducer. But when you got companies like Ford Motor Company and Toyota that put relative compression built into their factory tool, well, time for you to start doing it. You can right. do this with the Zeus. You go right into lab scope. In fact, you don't even have to open the hood up. You can go to pin 4 and 16, clear flood if the vehicle has it, about 80-something percent do. Clear flood is when your foot is all the way down the floor and the engine won't start because it cuts the fuel off. Got to be under 8,501 pounds. Anything above 8,501, it is not OBD2 compliant. But where would you find that? Under the hood of the vehicle on the decal, okay? So if you can do that, like Pete said, and rule out on 85 or so percent of the vehicles, hey, my mechanical problem. If yeah. not, what do you do? Well, then you got to do different type of tests, but never rule out mechanical problems. That's right. a biggie. Right. A super big. Yeah. And, and there are others like that, that that we can talk about as we go along that give you uh, a lot of bang for your buck in a short amount of time to help you, help you narrow down your focus on where that problem lies, whether it's mechanical, fuel, ignition, or an engine's ability to breathe. Exactly. Right? So it, it can only be in one of the four. That's true. And, you know, another great test, though, I know Pierre agrees with me with this. We're gas guys. So gas analysis, come on. I could put a probe in a tailpipe if I don't have clear flood and stuff. And look, if I have a high oxygen content, I got a bad engine misfire. That could be valve related. My CO2 is low. I got a problem. So you could use a lot of this stuff and snap on it. We can go right off our, our Zeus tower here and actually show you that information. I'd like to add something to that. Um, it's not just exhaust analysis. I'm a big believer in direct measurement, especially if in doubt. Measure it directly. Don't just trust your scan data or indirect measurements. Yeah, and that's another good point that Pierre's mentioned. Now, if you didn't hear, quite hear what he had to say, is that sometimes your scan data isn't always reporting accurately to you. And we're going to show some specific reasons that happens all, all, so you mean, all the time. So you mean it's fibbing to me, Pete? Well, you know what? Again, it goes back to what I said earlier. The ECM or any ECU, dumb as a bag of rocks, it can't do anything it's not been told to do. So the engineers were kind enough to provide all of these different sensors to help give them information. Only problem is sometimes these sensors aren't telling the ECM the truth. And it does the substituted value gain. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to talk about that. All right. And then, again, keep narrowing that down until you've got a, just a, a few suspects in mind. And then you can start doing your pinpoint test to eliminate until you've got that last man standing, and that's going to be the heart of your problem. Which brings to you number six, perform your repair. Once you think that you've deduced what the problem is, test it twice. Narrow it down. Say, okay, I've got it down to the number six injector. I found it out by doing this injector drop test. Do it one more time. Maybe a different Oh, but Pete, can. it's a new part from the deal. It's not going to be bad. It'd be like Pierre's car. Well, yeah, that two, goes back to where we said earlier about two new knock not sensors. including all the suspects. Pierre had two new knock right? sensors in his car, and guess what? They were bad. Yeah, that can always happen. You can never eliminate any possibility from your, from your uh, diagnosis. Verify, please. Always verify the repair is complete before you hand it over to your customer. I know G's a big fan of telling everybody that, you know, when the milk comes on and it shows up in your shop, well, that's the money lamp. But if it goes out and comes back later with it on again, what is that? That's the Friday night. You're not going home. That, <laughs> that's when they're going to start screaming at you in front of other customers yeah. because they think the light is on. It's why to document yourself. So when we show you later on the Zeus, 
to go through, see where your monitor status is. Very important. Because if you leave one monitor not ready, not complete, whatever you like to, to say, well, that's the thing that can pop on. Maybe your repair fixed the problem why that monitor wouldn't run. And now it does run. And the you suck light comes on because that's what they're going to say. You suck. I paid you to turn that mill off. They don't realize it may have been you did fix my O2 sensor. But now I got an EVAP or the dreaded P0420. Always perception, isn't it? Always perception. Cover so, your butt. So maybe you didn't solve the problem. But see, if you had gone what we said about earlier, about what does that what causes it to come on? How do you test to verify that? How do you use these different resources we're going to show you? There's no excuse for you not to make sure that the repair you made is indeed the repair for that problem. But as you pointed out, if you had gone back and done your homework, very beginning, what sets the code, what are the criteria, and then, oh, guess what? When this code is set, this test isn't going to run, that test isn't going to run, these codes could set. You need to be aware of that so that you don't find yourself in that situation right. where the light's back on, your customer's upset, even though it's a different problem that you didn't even know existed at the time the car came in. So check monitors, check generic OBD2 for those monitors and see what's happening, even a pending code. So, you know, one of the big things that we see, some people, and I just had a customer yesterday, Doreen asked me this, what's this guy calling you? He had his car fixed elsewhere. But he brought another car in that we fixed. But he says, on my BMW, I have a pending code. He had his own code reader. The shop that fixed it says, I ah, don't worry about it. So I had to tell him, look, if you got a pending code and it doesn't go away, and he drove 500 miles, sometimes it goes off, comes back, got a problem. Because we're going to talk about mode six. But one thing I want you to get in your head. You got mode six, fails X amount of times, depending on what the engineer typed in there. If it fails, we'll make a fictitious number of 10. Fails 10 times, where does it go? To a pending code. Fails a pending code according to EPA and SAE, okay? They say if it fails three times, you got to put the mill off. That's the money shot. So if you got something pending, you got something going on there wrong. Pierre had a thing where the monitors wouldn't go on his daughter's car. And if you don't have good mode six info where something is sitting there, sitting there, it ain't going to allow the monitor to run. This is why the complete diagnostics of the system needs to be completed. If not, you're going to get some surprises you're not going to like, and your Absolutely. customer won't come back. And then while you're doing that verifying the repair, if it's not fixed, if the mill does come back on, the code that you fixed reappears, but you know that the part you just replaced was bad, well, there may be more than one culprit, and you just haven't caught the whole criminal organization yet. You know, so don't don't count that out. There can be and has been more than one cause for a problem that I've had in my career. So that's that's fine. We have a friend's car right over in this bay. Okay. We had a problem with this. It had a P0011. It is a cam phaser issue. Put in a quality aftermarket because Ford didn't have it at the time. Wasn't available anywhere. Put it in. Car ran good for a while came back with an issue okay we tested it it was bad we said you know let's see if ford has it <laughs> got a ford one put it in ran good for a while again came back one of the things we didn't realize and we had done an oil change two oil changes on this car we had to run a special flush through it there were pieces of debris that you couldn't see causing a problem blocking the passages so variable valve timing would not work as designed i mean we looked at everything on this freaking car I mean, it costs us a ton of time and money. And of course, you can't charge your customer. So you need sometimes to check that whole complete thing. What can cause that? And we're all going to make mistakes. Right. Right? And that was a costly mistake for our shop here. Yeah. Okay? And I'm not embarrassed to say, no. hey, sometimes it, we maybe should have <clears throat> done that flush in the beginning. Car has 100 some odd thousand on it. You know, the part was verified bad. We checked it by putting power and ground to it, the original solenoid. You know, it had a new cam phase or chains, all that was good. We thought maybe even the machine shop may have messed up. And we did come up with a burnt valve that we found from relative compression. But guess what? There must have been debris still in the motor using a quality filter, two quality filters. We had to flush it out another time or two and it cleared the problem. Yeah. And so I, that'll screw you. But that's just what I said earlier. There's no gray area. It's either right 
Or it's wrong. Or it's wrong. Yeah. You got someone that's going to say, basically, you suck because the light came on. Yeah. And not good. Not good at all. All right. So, are there any questions about the process? And we're going to kind of go through that uh, in a moment on the car. I also want to go into this part because I know G's a big fan of it. So am I. Huge. When it comes to anything to turn the mill lamp on, the first place you should go on your scan tool, I don't care how big and fancy an aftermarket box you got, is global OBD2 mode on your tool. A Definitely. lot of good reasons for that. Exactly. Now, a lot of people go, oh, I got the factory tool. What are you taking all that out for when here's why the light came on? Remember, these are EPA rules of saying, how do we set that code? Remember we talked about code criteria? It's in generic, excuse me, or global OBD2. And that's important. And the other beauty part of it is, and I know you guys know this, because you, you probably have more than one scan tool in your shop, and they have to be updated. And if you want something to cover every manufacturer or model that might show up in your door, that's not cheap. The beauty about it when you're approaching a check engine light complaint is, as G pointed out, this is this is governed by CARB and EPA rules, SAE guidelines. No matter what the nameplate is on that vehicle, it has to do offer these 10 modes of access that we're going to go over with you real quick. Has to do it. So it doesn't that you no matter what the nameplate is, if you have a customer that comes in and the check engine lights on, you can access that data and information, fix that car. And I'm going to say from my own personal experience, I'd say at least 95% of the check engine light complaints that I ever dealt with, I fixed using global OBD2 alone. Didn't need any other information. Agree. For that is the biggie. I, I've been pounding that for years. Start with generic global OBD. Then go into, as you have on your Snap-on, you can go into Jeep or Toyota or BMW, whatever the case, Hyundai, Kia, yeah. whatever. And we're going to show you some other reasons for that. But I want to show you practically on the car so that you yeah. can see what we had talked about in, in, in before. So we're going to go through the, the modes very quick. If you're not aware of it, when you see a number like this, the dollar sign 01 means it's a hexadecimal number. It's computer, computer talk. I don't know all the details. Don't care. But just so that you know, these are the various modes, and you'll see them labeled like this. Oh, I thought you were going to give me a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> so you got mode one is where you find access to the current data, the live data. On your scan tool and that, yeah. and that may be how it's uh, listed on your scan tool when you go to the global obd uh, uh, modes, modes. Uh, access yeah. it's also where you can find the status of the monitors and we'll cover those in a little more detail as we go along all right mode two that's the home for freeze frame that g's already pointed out quite aptly and back to my um, uh, criminal minds scenario when these guys show up at the crime scene they never know what kind of shape it was going to be in some of them were in a real mess and evidence is tainted. They didn't really get any benefit from it. But you know what? If there was somebody on the scene that was taking pictures at the moment the crime occurred, how cool would that be to hand that over to the BAU guys? They right. would love you. And that's well, why that's... they look for any cameras in the area Absolutely. or any pictures that would have. And so that's why we got freeze frame. You bet. That's your cameraman. That's the person that took the picture, got the evidence, and has and got that waiting for you to look at. And it's, you're going to see uh, in a moment um, that there are a couple of different monitors that we talked about. One is a continuous monitor. It's misfire, uh, code related to, or test related to fuel ma management, fuel trim, and then the comprehensive components, which is pretty much everything that the reports to the ECM or the ECM takes care of. All of those are continuous, tested all the time. That's really where you need this data because, like she said, you can't rev it up in the bay and expect to duplicate the problem when it occurred at 70 miles an hour on the freeway. Or one I'm looking at right here, engine cooling temperature. You go, well, who cares? Very important because I've had many Toyotas and Fords that have a P0171 lean condition, top 10 codes in the US, it's in that list. And if you look at it, the temperature was cold. So you had contraction. And if you had contraction of the gaskets, the intake gaskets that are an issue, okay, if you didn't know that, you made the car warm up in your bay, go get a cup of coffee, a bottle of water, or tea, whatever. Guess what? By the time you came back and you're trying to smoke that motor or you're trying to spray some carburetor cleaner, which could be a little dangerous, or a brake cleaner, whatever you use, or propane and look for the problem, it ain't there. Why is it there? Because right. the gaskets expanded. 
you would have looked at freeze frame and it told you 50 degree temperature. Okay. Guess what? And I have law, you know, case studies with problem cars like this that I've done. You got to look at this. Too many people just kind of slip over and go, ah, we don't need that. Right. That guy don't know what he's talking about. The only thing I want to, as the caveat to that is it's a snapshot. It's a moment in time. Um, Some, some of the uh, factory stuff give you more than one freeze frame. Correct. Sometimes it might be more than one code that it saves the data for. But consider when you're looking at it, was the vehicle accelerating, decelerating, steady state? But you pointed out, look at fuel trims, look at the calculated load, look at the, the temperature, yeah. engine cooling temperature, was the engine cold, was it warmed up? All of these factors can help you recreate the problem so that you can end up uh, solving and, and fixing the problem. And Pete, right. you know, you're right. It's not the exact, exact, it's a 15% window. The old DRB3, used to give you that. It would give you a 15%. Either it happened 15% here or 15% after. Why? Have you ever taken your vehicle or any vehicle and looked at RPM, right? Engine RPM. And as that information's coming in, let's say you race it up, you go, boom. You heard it go to a couple of grand. You're looking at RPM, 700, 700, 700, 700, 700, 700, 700. Now the thing is down back at idle. You raced it up. Finally, it shows up 20-something hundred RPM. That's because these PIDs, parameter identification, is doing this. It's filling the bucket up. And it takes time to go down that list. Yeah. This is why, how many of you have ever seen, and you're going to see it on Snap-on, engine one, engine two, oxygen sensor, EGR, you know, any of these things. The reason why, if you had an EVAP problem, what the hell are you going into engine one for? And you want to have a larger list. EVAP, you'd go into EVAP. It's going to give you those PIDs that will update at the fastest rate. GM was the first one starting that. And, of course, others have followed. So that is also helpful. Look at this information and know what is going on. And, again, you guys and gals have got it light years ahead of what we did when we first started dealing with this stuff because the data PIDs that you're getting access to are much more – uh, well, I mean, there's a lot robust. Lot there's a lot more than there used to be. So you've got everything you need to fix the car right there in in the in the OBD2. Uh, and again, if you have any comments or whatever, please write them in there, and Pierre will keep us abreast. Yep. So like we said, it's a snapshot in time. We we probably already talked about that. A race will move on. Like I pointed out, continuous monitor faults more than the non-continuous. For example, if I'm dealing with a a uh, oxygen sensor heater code. You know, that's a non-continuous monitor test. All I'm looking basically at when I look at freeze frame is the conditions under which the test is going to con- happen. So that's really, that's only going to give me there. And one thing I'd like to, to add there with the continuous monitors, you heard Pete say this fuel. Well, that's easy to understand. Anything related to the fuel system, a disconnected injector, a shorted injector, something not right with fuel trim, that'll do that. Misfire, well, that could be from a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And that's going to give you a P03 codes, right? So comprehensive component this is the one that people go i never replaced a comprehensive component sure you have it's every sensor or actuator on the vehicle with the exception of the o2 sensor o2 heater okay egr or vvt nowadays uh secondary air all the non-continuous monitors that are there catalyst everything else that tranny solenoid it's in there the math sensor it's in there so think about that when you see CCM, a lot of those things could be bad, and sometimes you won't get a code for them, mm-hmm. right? And opens and shorts. All right, mode three. That's where you find that's what, that's what turned the mill light on, and that's that's the matured code from the pending uh, that we talked about earlier. And there are two different ones. There's mode one, mode two. Excuse me, one uh, first one trip and or two trip codes. Um, one trip, it means it's going to turn the mill on the first time the computer uh, tells it it's being told to fail. And the two trip is when the pending uh, becomes a matured code, turns the light on. Correct. Cool. All right. We talked about that. All right. Mode four. Mode four is where you get to clear the information. I think they already pointed out to way too many uh, techs who just automatically read the codes and then clear them. You don't want to do that because when you do, you're clearing out the freeze frame. You're clearing out the... Uh, um, uh, monitor status. Uh, so you're taking all that information, all the stuff that you saw in the crime scene, 
And like, and you're just, it's like pouring bleach on it, as you like to that say. That Clorox, throwing Clorox on it is the worst thing to do. Keep your fingers away from clearing DPCs until you document everything. Right. Once you document it, we're ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Sometimes I'll wait until I'm actually ready to verify the repair or, <coughs> excuse me, if I'm dealing with some things that uh, I want, like a laundry list of codes is in the system and I want to see what's currently active. I may clear it, see what it comes, comes back. back. But, but after not you until document, after I document it, right? And it's just too easy now for you to take a screenshot, capture it with your phone. Many, many of these the scan tools today will let you email it to yourself, text it to yourself or your customer. This is no no excuse to not document your, your right. content. And you've heard us tell you there's so many reasons to do that. Number one, you're covering your backside. You don't want problems later on when people say you didn't do X, Y, Z. And the second is you're showing yourself your customer that you're professional. You've shown the documentation. Here's why I'm recommending this repair. Here are the test results. Show them to you. You may not understand them, but you explain them. Give them a, a layman's explanation. Maybe highlight a few things. That goes in their records. They get to keep a copy to show the ladies at the bridge club. And then when you're done <laughs> and you have it repaired, you can Bingo. go back with those same test results and see here. Here's the documentation showing that what we did did indeed take care of your problem. And then they they have confidence in you and what you're doing. And like G pointed out, and we've got it. We've talked about this so many times. I'm going to get in my pulpit again for a little bit more. I know I'm preaching to the choir. I understand that. But there are so many in our industry that are still just shotgunning parts at problems. And on today's vehicles, that is not a cheap proposition to do. Who's footing the bill for this? The consumer's footing the bill. You wonder why we still have a bad reputation in general among consumers? That's why. We need to fix that. We need to fix that. But to your benefit, when you have a shop like that in your, in your community that's doing that to their customers, eventually they get fed up with it. Hopefully, they show up at your door. And yes, you may take it in the shorts to do the diag, but you know what? Once you fix that customer's car right and you show them and you treat them professionally, where are they going to go? We were talking about that earlier. G still got people coming from surrounding states to come to this shop because he kn they know that it's going to be done right and at a reasonable. And it's, he's not the cheapest guy in town. But no. the customers don't care about that. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you're a shop sex. owner and you're watching, your customer doesn't care what the price is. They care about the value that you're giving them for the money they're spending. They would rather pay you a little more and know that when they get it back, it's taken care of. I've seen guys bring cars here to the clinic up here in Mayo Pack. They just say, hey, Doreen, how you doing? Here are the keys. Let me know when it's done. And they don't even ask about how much the bill is. Just, just fix it and let me know when it's ready to be picked up. That's they a know, customer. That's a customer. That's the ones you want. They're gonna. That's the people that that you done right by. And you're, but you're not gonna get those unless you treat customers professionally. And I know that's what you guys and gals are doing. You're watching and you want to do it better because you're here with us tonight. Exactly. Jay, Pierre, you had a comment. And, and it's not about uh, the modes of OBD2. Question is about regarding how to test with a, a can problem. Okay. Uh, you know, what's the best way to use it? A scope or a multimeter or, a, you know, what's well, the best way to approach for, it? Okay, <laughs> so with a can problem, the question was, what's the best way? First thing is don't take the backhoe out. Now, Pierre loves taking his backhoe out, but the shovel may do the job. And what do I mean by that? Start with the scan tool. Why? We can get you codes, right? And we can see where the code is. Now, maybe if you do your 60 ohm check, go in to read about the information on the system, that may be your first step, but you may need a scope to finally narrow down what the problem is. It's interesting so, you say that. How many? You, I, and I'm kind of curious. For those of you who are watching, if you go to Motor Age or TST, I'm going to ask Motor Age first. If you go to the Motor Age Magazine YouTube channel, type a Y in there for me. If you go to the TST channel, type a T. I'm just curious how many of you watching have, have availed yourself of those resources. I just, I, there's a video that's coming out either it just did in June or it's going to be um, in May or it's coming out in 1st of June on this very, very topic. So if you're watching this on YouTube, then then you're going to see that answer to that question. And we've had some video. great, we've had some great guys like John Thornton and Bernie Thompson right. and stuff that we've had for TST doing network stuff. And it's important, but again, never over throw something into the game. Right. Start with the simplest things because sometimes it'll give you an answer. And to Pete, what to Pete said before, 
Now, a lot of times, once we document it, maybe that network code is not real. Something happened. Clear it out. And if it comes back, then you want to check it. Right. And the, the other thing, Pierre, before we go on with that, with um, different shops that clear codes, then you're going to have to drive the vehicle unless it is a 2011 or newer vehicle. Because we got no, no way of knowing what the freeze frame was, what the code was. They erased it. They threw that Clorox on that scene. Right. And now and you're not screwed. just the shop. There are certain. The part places, <laughs> that, believe me, we make a lot of money off the part places right. that so, do that. And if you're, what do you have say? I'm sorry. What I wanted to add to that was you should always do a full vehicle scan and you should look not only for network codes in that case, but voltage codes. Ah. Because voltage, yeah. low voltage or charging problems can create the network problems. Okay, so I hear that. If you didn't hear that, what we're saying is, and we're actually and kind of getting taking some of my thunder, but that's okay. Uh, about how you do a, uh, to check the entire system, especially when you're dealing with network codes, and not just look for the U codes, but look at anything that shows a low low power, low voltage condition anywhere in the system, which can lead to those, right. those codes. And, and especially on Euro cars and Pierre's favorite car, BMW, very common with network codes with voltage. You know, 15 is <laughs> 30, 15. They're your two, your two right. favorites. <laughs> All right. On to mode five. Mode five is the test results of an individual that uh, says to make up the oxygen sensor monitor. Um, we're going to talk about it in more detail when it comes to going into mode six and showing you mode six. Uh, that's probably like uh, the first, first, first few years of OBD2. Um, this 96 to 99 ish and one early 2000. Yeah. Mode five was only for oxygen sensor test, and it wasn't for every manufacturer. So you may right. see Toyota, some GM, very few other manufacturers used it. When it wasn't in mode five, this went into mode six, as Pete has here. Right, right. So it's there somewhere. Mode six. And I really want you to see the example is because we could do an entire webcast just on mode six. But Robo. what I want you to know about that <laughs> is that this is, this is where... The engineer has said, okay, ECM, I want you to check this component by doing this test and this test and this test. In other words, turn this thing on, watch this data over here, see what it does. If it does this, do that. If it does that, do this. Those are the individual tests that the ECM is using to verify the different systems it's in charge of. And I'm just going to throw a caveat in here as well. What's the ECM's number one job? Keep that catalytic converter happy. That's all it's supposed to do. Keep the catalytic converter happy. What does that mean? That converter has to have a very narrow range of feed gases going in for it to work effectively. If it's a little too much, a little too much, too little, it's going to run hotter. It's not going to be as effective, and it leads to problems with emissions, and, the, and that's not allowed to happen. The ECM's job is to keep that happy. So that vehicle can maintain the, the emissions rating it was first rated at when it was new. That's it, guys. So everything it does, all the tests it does, all the codes it can set is all tied to emissions. Right. And Stoichiometry, 14.701. Yep. Yep. And there's where a gas analyzer <laughs> comes into play to double check it. So when we're looking at, if you want to know what it is that the ECM is trying to test, well, we told you, you go to your code criteria, what the setting conditions are, what the enabling criteria is, and, and what those parameters are is all spelled out in more than one place for you, as we'll show you. But it's not just there. It's in mode six. You can access these different monitors. You can see the test results for yourself. And again, back in the day when it first started, they were all in hexadecimal numbers. They were gibberish when you looked at them to us. We didn't know if it was testing in amps, current, no clue. voltage, pressure, did no idea. But we did know that there was a test result, there was a minimum, and there was a maximum. And if that test result was in between the minimum and the maximum, we're in pretty good shape. If it was little to one side or the other, well, that was something we wanted to keep our eyes on. This is also where you can go to help in your verification process by looking at those mode six results before and mode six results after. after to give you an idea if your repair made it made a difference. So there's a lot there. We can go into a lot more detail. I do want to throw out one thing, too. It's it's, it's probably not as bad as it used to be because there's so many more vehicles with CAN. Um, but if it's a pre-CAN, pre-controller area network vehicle, which is pretty much anything before 08, I think, 
right? So if you get an older vehicle in, one cool True. thing about it is if you have a misfire and you don't have enhanced data for that vehicle, you don't have the misfire counter for that vehicle, that's okay. You got one. It's in mode Ford. Six. It's in mode, uh, mode six, pre-can. Yeah, oh, pre-can. But yeah. can and later is everybody. Right. And many companies started in 2003 going to can, but not all switched over. You know, and you'll see the difference. With can, you're going to see a bigger list. You're going to see more things being tested. Right. Sometimes non-can, you get a very small list. And it's not the scan to a manufacturer. It's the OE that didn't do yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mode 7. That's where you find those pending codes that G was mentioning earlier. Those are the ones that have failed but haven't been verified yet. This was actually the... Uh, help us out from OBD one day so we watch and remember that we used to have all kinds of ghost codes and drive you crazy you know the light would come on your customers wondering why it's coming on we were wondering why it's coming on but uh it, it were usually uh because the parameters were either so wide or it didn't take much to, to to trip it and again we go in and test it and there's nothing there to find so this is a way to say okay i had that thing show up but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna upset anybody yet until i see it consistently and then i'll turn the check engine light on Right. And by the way, you see mode seven, continuous monitors. What was a continuous monitor? <gasps> One of them was misfire. Right. Misfire was supposed to be in mode seven. They switched misfires to mode six. But think about how wide a misfire is. We could be talking, number one thing comes to people's mind with a misfire. Oh, it's ignition. Or it could be fuel. Or it's mechanical, which people always forget. Or it could be EGR type related. <laughs> You can have an emission device actually cause that, right? Yeah. And I'm not talking just a, a PCV, but if we had a lean enough mixture, even PCV can cause something like that. Yeah. Okay? And, I, and before I forget, because we recently did a webinar entitled the top 10 DTCs. Oh, we did. And yes. what to do about them. And what was kind of started that kickoff was you've already heard me say how I feel about statistical diagnostics, uh, the, the test don't guess uh, kind of a thing. But... If you're now on, on a motor race training account, you have access to all these free webinars. If you if this is your first time or you are, aren't aware of this, you can go into that webinar library and, and add as many as you want to your account for you to watch at your leisure. And that's one of them. You can you can watch that whole thing and you want to know more about misfire diagnosis, you go find it. It's in there. Yeah, we've, we've been doing been, this for years. Yeah, we're as old as dirt. A long time. So there's yeah. a lot of stuff for you. Uh, there are some there are some on demand stuff in there that you know, up to you. If it, but if it's valuable, I think that you find the even then we weren't asking much for them. It was no, just, it was a they were very reasonable cover our expenses. That, you know, but that's but you know, it's there for you. So take advantage of it. You get that motor training account now. Dig in and, and look at all the resources that you have available to you. And let's see how many first timers. If it's your first time, put the letter F in there. Oh, not a V. Well, you know, <laughs> F is, is easy to hit, but the first time. We don't mean F in a bad way, by the way. No, no Letter F. All right. Okay, first timer. Any first timers? A lot of great comments with each other there, so I appreciate the, the interaction that you guys are yep. showing. It's very, very important. You know, we all kind of learn from one another, and the interaction is always important. We do. And, and thank you if it's a first timer. Right. I'm not sure exactly what – it's a little off, but it says he has a – Somebody has a four-channel diesel kit, whatever that is. You think it would help diagnosing uh, problem cars? I don't know what a four-channel diesel kit is. But. Okay, so the question is: I guess somebody typed in something about a four-channel diesel kit. And What's you clarify a, that for us so we understand yeah. what you're referring to? I I don't have a clue um, here. I, I do but a lot of first time, as I see, yeah. you see a lot of Fs. Uh, Fs yeah, yeah, very good. Thank so, you. So take advantage of the resources that you've got available here. You know the, that we've been doing like and don't forget you could email pete or myself and we'll get back to you absolutely uh mode eight uh, i don't really see that much it's a it was uh i guess when they thinking about using bi-directional controls the global obd2 the only thing this does is seal up the evap system so you can test it and and then only on some vehicles so if you're mm -hmm. going to check the evap system for leaks try it out it can't hurt and if it seals if it tells you it's a, the command's been accepted well then you can go ahead with your pressure and leak te vacuum tests yeah, and it just saves you saves some trouble. EPA wanted the uh, scan tool manufacturers to do it as well as the OEs. But like Pete said, it doesn't always work. No, and they wanted to put VVT in here as well. So maybe down the road you'll get a little more. But right now EPA is working on heavy duty uh, OBD two. Yes. So yes. that is a big thing <coughs> down the road. This is for vehicles eighty five 
101 pounds down, right. not up, right. down. Okay. Mode nine, uh, that can be very valuable for you. Uh, this is where you find the, the VIN that's been stored in the ECM as well as its current calibration. Uh, remember, we talked about te technical service bulletin. So if there is a reflash um, put out for a vehicle, you can see what that, that uh, the range of calibrations that are involved. And if you're on the list, well, then it's a pretty good idea that that's needed to help solve your customer's problem. And not so much anymore, but early on, uh, a lot of shops were putting in used ECM. And the VINs didn't match, and then of course uh -huh. the cars didn't like that too much. You can't do that much anymore. You, I mean, I think you must be mind few, reading me. Yeah, the last few model years, right? Just like you're not, if it's not a virgin ECM that you can program in, it's not going to work at We're all. We're going to talk about this. Number one, we had a Ford Explorer in here that we tried everywhere from the dealer to aftermarket to autopcms.com, which is a great company for used computers. Couldn't find one. A Google search, we found someplace we have never used them before. They said, we have it, and we'll program it. I said, I don't need a program. I have the Ford IDS. I can do it. Just send it to me. Nope, we got a program. <clears throat> we had a check engine light on the car with one code, because it was a circuit burned out, something shorted out. We had put a new solenoid in. We get the computer. Bill puts it in the vehicle. All of a sudden, now we got more lights on the dash. <laughs> Like, what the hey, and more codes. We go look mode nine. You know, the last eight of the VIN when they programmed it, Bill gave him the number. Someone must have hit the wrong number. We were off on the engine number. We had our programming in, there were no codes, they were gone. So, mode nine verifies the VIN. And in certain states, like here in New York, for inspection, they look at if you got a different VIN in there, you're cheating. Okay, it has to match up. Now, newer vehicles start going, hey, who's on the bus? Why doesn't this VIN match up with the other VIN? And Pete is right. So we just had a couple of late model Fords. We're talking like, you know, 18, 19, one, I think was a, a 20. And that particular thing, Pete's right. You cannot program it. If it has a VIN in it, it needs to be virgitized. Okay. Now, we did this for years on Ford, and my buddy Lenny, uh, that Pierre knows as well. We sit on a high school board together of automotive. And I called him up and say, Len, what the hell is going on here? Why can't I go in? I thought there was something wrong with my IDS. Well, it wasn't something wrong with the IDS. He said, ah, about four versions ago, they don't allow you to do it anymore. They want you to buy a new computer, yeah. a virgitized one. Yeah. And I will say that there are some guys out there who are mastering the art of taking these these ecms down and uh, working on the eproms in the on the circuit boards it's some very delicate work um i don't advise this for most guys because it takes a little little bit more expertise but you uh, need a whole bench you need a whole bunch yeah, of stuff some, there are some options that, but you know again it's all comes from re reading and understanding the process and doing like you guys and guys are doing and going to training oh yeah and if you get a good guy one of my students josh weaver he does this, and he's good at it, but it takes some time. Is it worth doing that in every car? You may not have the time. Number one, you need special training. You need special tools. Right. So you got to pick your poison which way you want to go to virgitize something or not. Right. Okay. But you, good point. You just can't do it on many cars. And last but not least, the 10th mode of OBD2, permanent codes. I love this one. This is the Clorox suck it up. <laughs> now, what do I mean by the Clorox suck it up? Well, you know when to do to race the codes? Well, if the vehicle is 2011 and newer, <sighs> Mode 10, my best friend. Because we have one of those places and a couple of shops down the road that we get cars from. They love hitting the erase button. This helps us out only on newer ones. Okay, 2011 and up. Yeah, so in other words, these are the codes that you can't erase no matter how hard you try. Uh, use the clear uh, 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 code clear on mode four. No, nope, not going to happen. Disconnect the battery and bleed down the capacitors. Keep live memory. No, nope, not going to happen. Uh, they're going to stay in there. The only person that can get rid of these codes is the ECM itself. Yep. And that kind of leads me to a wrap up point when we're talking about doing any kind of diagnostics that involve a code or ECU. Your, your, you know, Mrs. Johnson may be the one paying the bill, but the thing you got to satisfy is that control module. If you, if your repair doesn't meet the specs for the tests that the ECM is going to run on it, 
the light's going to come back on. It's just that simple. Yeah. That's why we're stressing so much so far about doing your homework, understanding what it is that the ECM is testing, how it's performing the test, what parameters it's looking at, because that's the information you can use to do those verification repairs and the diagnostic repairs that led you to the problem. No doubt. Let me just clarify one thing. I know you know what you said, but people may not get it. So if the codes are erased, clear, if the codes are cleared, in regular code, if you go in to read the code, you don't see anything. You got to go into mode 0A slash mode 10. So I want to make that clear. The codes may be cleared out of the regular place, Very good, yep. but not in mode 10. And if you don't go to mode 10 or your scan tool, and we're going to show you on the car, does it have mode 10? Well, then you're pretty well messed up, right? Yeah. You won't be able to do it. Well, it's a, again, it's a little piece of information that, that did the detective didn't get, right? Exactly. And that's just that just messes up your, your time. Um, want to throw this out real quick before we get started on the vehicle. Again, this is sponsored by Snap On. We're going to be using the, the new Zeus tonight in our in our diagnostics when we get on the car. Um, we're working on a 2014 Jeep. Um, but let me ask you a question. How many of you guys have run into an issue with Chrysler's secure gateway module? or any of the FCA products from that, right? It's 2018 and up, right? Yeah. So we, we started, I think, in some 17s, late 17s, but 18 and up definitely, where you will be locked out of the gateway module, okay? Now, not only on Chrysler's, one of the things they do want people to be aware of, every manufacturer is going to go to this. Already, Nissan, with their tool, factory tool, will not let you in on 20, late 2020s, 21. You cannot get in because they're locking you out of the gateway. Mm -hmm. They want to verify you only on their tool. Now, auto auth, this here, like in this shop, we have obviously Snap-on and every, in fact, every aftermarket schedule there is. If your tool, number one, has to be on the internet, that's number one. If your tool is registered with auto auth, it's 75 bucks, you get the number, the serial number off the back of your scan tool. You put it in there, and every technician that works here in his shop, I get all the information at Ottawa. Up to six people is 75 bucks. More than that, then there's an extra fee. And that is only for FCA products. And so, or Sullivan's, yeah. or yeah. Sullivan's, whatever it is. So, called. let's talk about that a little bit. The, the Secure Gateway module, if you look at the schematics, you see that you've got two lines going to the, the CAN pinouts on your DLC, the diagnostic link connector. But if you look more closely, you see that these are called diagnostic CAN. This is not a direct link. The, the fellow who asked the question earlier about diagnosing network issues, if you're trying to see what that CAN pattern looks like or what those termination resistors look like, if you can't get past the gateway module, you're not going to find out you know, th that those two wires are not going to give it to you. So that's one reason you have to be able to get that by this thing. It all started because it's all a matter of security issues for the OEMs. And I'm not going to beat a, you know, right. the over they that. shut off a vehicle, but, yada, yada, yada. I just know that. But that. what I want you to understand here is that AutoAuth is where you can go, but it's just for this manufacturer. Right and now. As you pointed out, with Nissan coming up and others talking about it, it was a big topic at the Equipment Tool Institute. Um, some of the manufacturers there said we're not going to go that route. Others who weren't there <laughs> could. Uh, Mercedes has got some other issues that we won't even get into tonight, but these are all infringing on your ability to access the information you need to work on these vehicles, which is why we want to talk about this one next. The National this. Highway, not National Highway, <laughs> the National, National Automotive, Automotive Service Task, task Force. Task National Force, Automotive right? Service Task yeah, Force. NASA. Very important to be a member, by the way, free. Sign up here for a free account. We need your input. You know, everyone always complains, Pete. Oh, I never got a say in what's going on. Well, maybe if you strength in numbers, you sign up, get a free account. If you're going to program cars, get into security, you definitely want to get an LSID slash VSP, yeah, a locksmith or vehicle service professional account. Otherwise, when a car comes in here, I can have the factory tool. If I don't have the authorization, I can't do it. Right. So very important. We got a question from the yeah. question. Um, after a repair is completed, is it better to clear the codes or is it better to just drive the vehicle and let the codes, the, the monitors run and clear themselves? Ah, depends right. on a year of the vehicle. It's a well, very good good question. Good. I'm going to repeat the question in case you didn't hear it. Yes, repeat. Sure it could, sorry. Um, so what the question that was being asked was 
if you are ready to verify your repair, is it better to clear the, clear the codes and and run the monitors again to verify the repair? Or what was the other option? Or, or let it clear it itself? It let or let the car them. check engine light clear itself? Okay, so there you go. Go ahead. Okay, so now it uh, depends on the year of the car. Older vehicles, you had to clear the code. You look at some uh, service information of when a code sets or monitor criteria, it will say like Toyota, certain older Toyotas, no DTC, no pending DTC could be in the PCM. The PCM would have to be cleared. Now, newer ones, if you want to see if your repair is effective, and again, with state inspections here in New York State, we need all but one monitor for 2001 and up vehicles, mostly what we work on, obviously. 2001 is a long time ago, by the way. 20, 20 plus years ago, right? 21 years ago. Wow, I'm getting old already, just thinking of it. But anyway, so we prefer if the car is newer, don't clear the code. We replace that O2 heater or whatever. We're going to drive it. You find in service information, what is the criteria for the O2 heater monitor to run? And it'll tell you yada, yada, yada. The one that'll mess you up is always evac. So we tell the customer, look, here's the deal. You can leave the vehicle with us. It's probably take a day or two because we need two good trips and it has to cool down. So we will get the right amount of fuel in the vehicle. Some manufacturers, 15 to 85%. Some Toyotas, a half to three quarters of a tank. Whatever they say, don't fill the tank up. Don't let the, be, the tank be under the minimum. Once you do that and run it, then the monitor could see that it was good. It takes the check engine light off, but in 40 warm-ups, the code will be gone. So if you go looking in and go, damn, the code is there. That guy was an idiot. He told me the wrong thing. No, no, no. The manufacturer leaves the code in there, but takes the light off after three good trips. Okay. So think about that. It, they will clear out in a period of time. It will be reduced to a pending code and then just go away if you fix the vehicle. Yeah. Question. Question is, uh, in the Zeus, is it possible to zoom in on a single waveform like you can say in a Pico? Or, you know, yeah, you could zoom in it. Yeah, yeah I think it's, just, it's a matter of setup, um, a little different setup on, on the snap-ons. I personally mount that up on the. But it does allow it does allow zooming. You can do one time. There's there's little times you can click on it. You can't do that. You can do some zoom. But we're not here doing the lobster part of it at least. No, not tonight. That'll be that'll be a different night. And and just to (laughs) kind of add to what you were saying, or what to the question that was being asked about uh, uh, letting the code clear itself, or uh, that you you don't really know how long it's going to take. But what I wanted to add to that was. We talked earlier about, okay, I know for sure, 100%, I've got this problem fixed. Turn the light off, send it down the road. If you haven't had those monitors complete, you don't know it's still hiding in the, in the dark, lurking to show its ugly head. So it's always a good point to make sure that you get those monitors complete so you can verify that. Or advise your customer when they come to pick the vehicle up. Mr. Customer, here's the documentation to back up what we talked about when I showed you the pre-repair information. We know we have this problem taken care of, but your computer tests so many different systems on your vehicle. It has not completed all of those tests. I'll tell you what, you come back in a week. Let me connect to your, to your, your, your car real quick. We'll make sure there's nothing else there that you and I don't know about yet. As a consumer, and I've been wrong. If you, if you follow me on Facebook, you know, I just ran into this big time with the airline service. <laughs> I tell you what, man. That was and, funny. And, and if you, anything you do as a consumer, How's your customer service experience been lately? Don't use well, how you're being treated by other businesses, model how you treat your customers. Distinguish yourself. Over pro, or under promise, over, over deliver. deliver. What I mean by that is make sure you keep the line of communications open to your customer. You let them know if there's anything at all they might need to expect uh, to come, or if you're or if you're if you know that if if down where I'm at, if a hurricane hits Tuesday. I can still have I can still have that car fixed on Friday. That's the day I'm going to tell them. If I call them up on Wednesday and said it's ready, guess what? I'm going to be a hero. But if I tell them, oh, another 30 minutes, I'll have it done. Oh, another 30 minutes, I'll have it done. Oh, another 30 minutes, I'll have it done. What, how does that make you feel as a customer? Then not real good, right? No. You know, so be upfront with your customers. Be professional with your customers. Under promise, 
over deliver, over -deliver. and you'll be your hero in your country. I'd agree. Do we have any other questions on NASTAF, National Automotive Task Force? Very important. Yeah, um, I do have one more thing on that, too. Yeah. Yeah, I want to make sure that you guys are aware. You may have heard something. Maybe you haven't. This has been some time now uh, where there was a big push in Massachusetts to pass a law called Right to Repair. Um, it was a way to force vehicle manufacturers to make certain information available to the automotive aftermarket. Uh, it is only related to emissions, but... Rather than go through all 50 states, the OEMs got together and signed what's called a letter of under, a memorandum of understanding saying that, you know what, we will give you the, the emissions and access to the other stuff um, kind of voluntarily on a handshake. And, um, and, and for a long time, that was working. Now, not so much. As he said, Hyundai gate, Kia, we have a gateway problem. module. Uh, Mercedes is really buying a bull on the, honoring this agreement. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on. What I really want to bring to your attention is currently on the Hill in, in Washington is a, a, a legislation called the Repair Act. And it's there primarily to protect consumers' rights to decide who fixes their car, the dealer or you. And if, if you want to stay in business, then this That'd is be me. that directly affects, me and you. affects you. So um, check it out. Find out more about it. And take a moment to drop an email to your congressman, your representatives on the hill, and let them know that you want to see this kind of legislation passed. Um, because right now it's all in a handshake, and you know how those deals can work, right? Right. And you know, being involved with NASTEF for since its inception, I can tell you, Peter's right. One minute some company didn't want to deal with us, gave us information. Hyundai Kia, for in fact, gave everything for free in the beginning. For the beginning, yeah. And then they just got, you know, maybe new management, who knows? They just got crazy and they want to hold back. And it's like a monkey see, monkey do type thing. Mercedes is not given information. Oh, well, hey, maybe we won't give information. Yeah. Well, they're so, getting away with it, right? But like tough. you said, it costs, go and write this down, www.nnovemberastf.org. Write that down. When you're done with the webinar tonight, go to that site, sign up, cost nothing. You'll see this page but, right here, www. NASTF.org, free NASTF account. Yep. Go there. Free NASTF account. Because these are the guys who are the intermediary, intermediaries between us and them. They're yep. the ones who are, are helping fight for us right. Like we talked about earlier with Tesla, they, they're working with them to get this information out to us. They've been instrumental in getting uh, heavy duty in line with uh, service information and access. And they're the ones who open up the doors here for everything that you're getting currently with the factories. Support them. If, if your name's on the roster, it just gives them it a helps. clout. And one thing I want to add, so Pete, you know, like you said, very important thing. This is about emissions, mm -hmm. but don't we have to fix electrified vehicles down the road? Yeah. Right. Well, Ford Motor Company, what did Ford do? They got Ford gas and, and diesel is still the old Ford Motor Company. Ford Electric is a new company. Does that mean we can have a risk down the road of where they don't give us information because what pollutants are they putting out? Zippo yeah. out of the tailpipe. Right. So we got to be on this game that he brought up the stuff that's in there, that bill. You need to respond now to this type of stuff. Don't wait until the horse is out of the barn, per se. Right. Because that's what always happens to us on this end. Right. And then we got a problem trying to get information for the vehicle. Yeah. And, and again, and I applaud Tesla for putting that information out. We want it to stay out. Who knows when they can take it away? Yeah. Handshakes are a different story nowadays, not yeah. like years ago. Someone gave their word, gave you a handshake. We were good. That being said, I think we probably got to move on. Right? I'll get move on. And da, 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 let's go over the car. All oh, right. So let me go turn the little buttons on. And let me just wake this thing up. And when you get by, you just slide that over. All right. Yeah, just this, uh, snooze that. Yeah, snooze. All right. So, if you're familiar with Snap On Tools, this is the home screen um, of their tool. This is the Zeus that we're using today. And, like we said, when we're going to start off with, with a uh, check engine light or drivability complaint, one of the first things I want to do is go to Global OBD2. So, we'll kind of got that. There we go. And we have our cho choices OBD uh, diagnose. Start communication. 
And remember, again, the reason we're doing this because is the global OBD2 across any platform is the same. All right, the same access to information. So, and by the care. way, some of the information you just pulled up there gave you the VIN. Right, give me the VIN information. I can always use to check that against uh, the vehicle information to make sure that it matches. And then you can see now this is not labeled out necessarily all of them in, in uh, the mode order, but we do see uh, mode one display current data. And we're just going to say, where are we going to start first? If I'm a tech, I'm going to go to trouble, uh, see what kinds of codes in there, right? So and that'd be a us. good thing to do, right? So right now we've got a P0108 manifold absolute pressure, barometric pressure sensor circuit high. Now, if you're not familiar with this, circuit high and circuit low is an indication. It's first as part of the comprehensive component monitors. It's checking the electrical circuit to the sensor. This does not mean the map sensor is bad. Oh, what do you mean? That's a code. <laughs> That's a code. So we're going to sell you a map sensor, Mr. Customer. You and then they can fix it. Make the problem go away, right? <laughs> But so when you usually when you see circuit high, that's indicative of an open, an open circuit. And if it's a circuit low, short, short, most so, of the time, nine out of ten times, that is something on any system on a vehicle. Yep. And Very then, important to know. Then we have a U code, okay, communication code. Then we say it's one of Pierre's favorite codes. And then we have another uh, manufacturer specific code, a P1 DD2. And this is all showing up in global OBD2. If it's emissions related, it's it, got to show up here. You bet. All right. And it's here. Now, I'm not done yet. I know what's what's been affirmed and what's turned the light on. Is there anybody waiting in the wings to do the same thing? Where'd I go for that? Mode seven. Let's go to mode seven. I mean, you see, we got mode six here. We're coming back to him. We can just mode seven right now, see what else might be in there. So here's your pending, if you recall. So these are the same ones that we saw. So no surprises. There's nobody waiting to jump on board the wagon that we need to be aware of. I got one more place to go, though. Yep. Where are we going? Mode 10. Now, Mode 10. And remember, what did we say before about Mode 10? If it's not a 2011 and newer, oh, can't get the info. This is a 14. This should pull up everything that was there. And there it is. That's what we got. We've got a... PO113 intake air temperature sen sensor problem. Uh, the 108 we knew about. Oh, look at that. PO300 random misfire has been in there. Got cleared off. But got cleared know. off. Uh, okay. And then we still have the same two that we had. So we've got a new candidate in there. It might be part of this, this customer's drivability. Wouldn't have found it unless we checked all three sources. Right? And that's, that's why you want to go into 0A mode 10. Look at that information right there. Now we can just go and we can check real quick into the uh, live data. We'll go back into mode one for that. And we also want to check readiness. Yeah, we can go and check the monitors. Yeah, absolutely. So now it's pulling up all the data from this vehicle. There we go. Now, a couple of quick notes when you're looking at these data pits. As you can see, on a late model vehicle, and you've seen this, they've got a ton of pits to select from, right? A bunch of them select from. Do I need every single one of them to fix the customer's problem? Probably not. But if I leave all of them on there, then I'm going to have to wait for every single one of them to refresh. And the list, like start. I said before, right? Right. It's going and, down and that's that exactly list. exactly what's going on. The, the, the scan tool is making uh, inquiries of the ECM saying, hey, what's that absolute throttle position, partner? And the ECM goes like, oh, let's see, 16.1%. Then the scan tool would, okay, what about relative throttle position? Well, that's uh, 5.9%. It's going to go down the list until it's gone all the way down the list. So when you're doing your diagnostics, select the PIDs, just the PIDs that you think you need to check the system you want to check. That'll help with the refresh rate. And and why is that again, Pete? Was that like something I said before about that RPM when I raced it up? Exactly. It, it stayed at 700 and took a while to go up there. Then it finally came down. Yeah. That's what Pete's saying. Pick the PIDs. Yeah. Yep. Pick the PIDs, six of them at the most will give you the best results. Now, here's something else I want to kind of throw at you. I'm going to put in graphs so you can see it a little better. Come on there. Intake air temperature. We saw the code for that earlier, intake air temperature sensor. Right now, it's reading what? 78, 78, 78 degrees. Fahrenheit. Now, if you saw that, that's a number that you hey, that sounds pretty normal. Sounds okay to me. I'm, I'm not going to worry about that being out of parameters. But watch this. I'm just going to reach over here and unplug it. So he's unplugging 
the uh, the intake air. And now look at what it what what it did. Minus forty. Minus forty degrees. Do okay. we see the jump of where we were? And by the way, graphing, in my opinion, is always better because my eyeball can see, whoa, whoa what's that big change? We went all the way down here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I want to show you one other thing while we're still in this particular data list. First, remember that number. Remember IAT, IAT unplugged, minus 40. Just remember that number. We're going to come back to that. But yep. here's what I want to show you as well. Okay, so it's plugging it back in. Plug it back in. Here's something that's kind of a nice, nice uh, neat little feature that, that Snap-on offers. It's a, called a, a flag tracker. And I want to show you if I can show you how to use it properly. We're just going to open up the menu and pull setup. And see, now I'm going to, I can actually put in a specific way to track that data pit. All right. So when we're looking at this, let's just say that we want to use a minimum uh, of, oh. Uh, and you go to screen, Pierre. We just call it minimum, let's just say 70, 75. Yeah, if I can get in there. Yeah, use the mouse. Gonna mouse it up. Oh, I gotta turn it off first. My bad. So he's gonna put this in so, a let's, minimal. Let's make it 80. So he's gonna we'll put, put 80 maximum, degrees. Um, let's make it 200. And we're gonna arm it and we're gonna save it. Now you can see I've got this little flag outlined on that data pin. Right up there. Now you can use this, and we're going to show it again when we go to the next mode, but you can even use this feature on generic global OBD2 and show that, 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 that flag uh, as, a, as a tracker. But what's nice is, ideally, when we're going to use that tracker, we can use an OB2 as, as part of a test drive scenario. Okay? So what we want to do here is... And look at, it's in red to tell us there was something there. It highlighted in red rather than the gray, and your flag is up. Yep. Well, let's see what happens when we unplug it, see if it comes. So that's on the minus 40. Minus 40. Right. And the flag is still up because we already had disturbed yep. that circuit. So it's showing you a problem on that circuit. If you see a flag up, you see a red color, you know you got a problem. I think that was my fault because I don't want to mislead anybody here. I want to go ahead and reset those parameters. Oh, because you, you know why I did that? Because my minimum was it. Yeah, your minimum. So the minimum was 80. If you're looking at what Pete's doing now, that's why it red it red flagged it. So if he goes to 70. Well, let's see. Let's make that. Oh. Let's try that. Not seven. minus 70. <laughs> no. Seven zero. Seven so zero. now it shouldn't be red. There All you right. go. So, so if you look at normal. that. Yeah. Pulling we, on that, Doreen. Okay, let the camera just see that. There it's not go. in red now. So let's stay on that. And Pete's going to pull it. Plug the intake. We'll falsify it there. Now watch it. Watch this thing go. It's going to come up in red. Don't make me a liar. There we go. Okay. Does everyone see that? Yeah. So this is a way, to, again, to, to show you where that fault uh, might have occurred. There's a little bit more to it when we get into the other mode here. But I just want to show you that's available uh, on this. So remember what we said earlier about that intake air temperature being at minus 40 with an unplug. Some of the, a lot of you guys are probably used to seeing with that or an engine coolant temperature sensor. And that's an open circuit, yeah. like we said, right? Open circuit. Right. So we'll get out of here. And uh, we'll get, we check the readiness monitors. This is some very important information to know. Monitors complete uh, since DTCs were cleared. So now Last. it's going to pull up all those monitor status and see what it has on there. And look at this list. Not complete, not complete, not supported. Not supported means not on the vehicle, right. not complete. So you see test complete here for misfire, comprehensive component. Uh, and you should have misfires somewhere. Yeah, right there. Okay, there's component misfire. So those are always ready or complete. 
yeah. non-continuous that are not complete. The EVAP, the catalyst, air conditioning's not on this car. Okay. But what this is a clue for you guys is when you're doing your homework, you're doing that research, you saw we found something in permanent codes, right? And we also know that, boy, there's a whole lot of stuff that hasn't been tested yet because these aren't complete. We know, first of all, of course, that somebody's cleared the codes. They yep. poured the bleach in the crime scene, so we don't know how much information we really have or what we're working on. But we, uh, that's one of the things that that tells you. But we also know that until they start flagging complete, we don't know who might be hiding in the wings to come and bite us on the backside. Right. And this may uh, may accelerate that you suck code, yeah. right? Yeah. And these people may come in saying, you fixed my car, but hey, the light's back on. And who wants to hear that? Right. And uh, again, we're going to we'll take a look at uh, mode A just for giggles so you can see what it looks like. You, you're in nine. Oh, I'm in nine. nine. I'm sorry. But we got like the VIN. So now the VIN, this is a real important thing. Remember I told you, in fact, that article will be in an upcoming Motor Age one. It's going to be one of the problem cars we had. For the simple reason, who would have thought that something like that could make more problems than the one you had in the car? Yeah. You have to look at the VIN. So right here, we would take that ECU VIN number and does it line up for this particular vehicle? Yeah. Very important. And of course, there's calibrations and all this that you can see here to make sure it's right on that vehicle. Yeah, and a lot more information now on these later model vehicles. If we just look at all that. The, 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 the more, the newer the vehicle, the more info, yeah. no doubt. And let's see, we were in. And we did mode 10, right? We did mode 10. Um, there we go. There's mode on board. So now on board, this is the one that EPA said you should be able to shut the vent solenoid so you can do the test on the EVAP system. Yep. And let's see. Not supported. Very common. This, this is common. A lot of the manufacturers did not follow the EPA recommendation. And then we have uh, one more we want to hit. We're going to go back in and take a look at the mode six stuff. Now, this is important info, Mode 6. When Mode 6 comes up, you want to see if anything's out of whack. Now, when monitors are not ready, Mode 6 info may not be given to you or may not be correct. Mm -hmm. And notice here you got a couple of things. You got MIDS, monitor ID, TIDS, test ID, and SIDS, component ID. So if you go into, let's say, O2, Pete, when you pick O2. Now, we can see what comes up, and it'll give us different parameters if we're between the goalposts. So it says, number one, I always look, is it ready? No, right? Uh, O2 cycle enabled, yes. Did it complete? No. And then it would tell you, here's the test results. If you look down here, you got a test results from the ECO. You got a minimum of zero, zero, a max of zero, zero. Results not complete because it yeah. didn't run the monitor. So how could I be between the goalposts? It would be impossible, right? <laughs> Let's see if we can have one that's got some. Oh, well, here's the misfires. We know that's complete. We told you that was going to be in any any global OBD2 uh, can enable uh, uh, vehicle. And then now you can see that we've got a uh, result passed. But again, to stress what we were saying, there's a min, there's a max. Min zero, max 65535. That is not how many misfires. That's a part of the hexadecimal numbering. That's the computer speak. All I need to worry about right. is what's the test result and how that compares. And the big thing is look for the pass or failed. Worry about failed. If it's not ready, that means the monitor has not been set on that one. Right. So here we got a pass. Am I going to 100% believe it? Well, most likely, yes. Why? Because those monitors are always ready. Misfire, fuel, and comprehensive component. And if I wanted to, if we wanted to go through all six cylinders here, remember we had the PO300 in there? Right. If I want to get some lines on who was in that random. I can go through these test results and see if there's any. Uh, right. Test you would values. see you would see a value on something if right. it had a misfire. You, you have a count. Question? Question? Yeah, the question is this, since you're working on a Chrysler, uh, he'd like uh, to really be happy if you go over global disable on the misfire monitor. Global, global disable. disable. That is. I didn't be. even seen it here. Yeah. Don't know what global. Monitors, I'm not sure what's, what that is. What's global disable? I'm not familiar with that either. Clarify that for us, there, partner. Whoever answered that question. What are you asking me? And I'm, and I'll be the first one to tell you. We will tell you we don't know everything. No, there's only one person that does. He Man above. Here. He ain't here. 
So he's uh, looking down. But with his connections and the time that we've both been in this side of the business, if there's a question like that that needs to be answered, we'll get the answer for you. So, I just I have not I'm not familiar with that at all. Yeah. And having been involved with the final ruling of OBD2, my name is in the final document on that. And things like that, I, I don't have a clue. There's the H, uh, HS3000, which is the uh, SAE book, the Bible on OBD2. So if you give us more information, I could uh, yeah. look it up, but I've, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Sorry. We'll have a, our emails once again at the end of the presentation. So by all means, don't let that hang. Now you got me curious. I'll be like Googling and stuff at the hotel room tonight. So, All right. So that pretty much covers it for the global OBD2 side. Again, anything you need for information to handle a check engine-like complaint is going to be in here. But if you have access to enhanced, it doesn't hurt to go looking over there. Right. Start here, and the next thing Pete's going to do, this is good for a check engine light, a drivability problem, I mean, hesitation, misfiring. Start in generic global. The next step we're going to do is super important. And that next step is we're going to go into the tool. We're going to start communication. But this time we're going to pick a Jeep. Okay. So it's going to go through the system. And by the way, this Zeus is wireless. Tells us make sure you're right on the right VIN. We're going to hit continue. And oh, I didn't get out. Oh, you didn't get out. You're still in generic. No, let's see what we get out. Clear that out and go in again. So go into the suite. So here's what he said. Nope, Chrysler right. has a global disabled feature on the misfire. I have found that it sets this in two cases, low fuel and if the camera crashes. Oh, he's talking about the computer oh, shutting it off. Okay, now we're with you. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. I thought he meant on the tool. Yes. Okay. So not only Chrysler, you have Audi, Volkswagen. If the fuel level is too low, you will not see a misfire. There are parameters. Again, that's where the RTFI read the freaking information because the manufacturer will cut it off. You can get fuel slosh. Fuel slosh will make a misfire. And same with the crank. It's measuring the crank of whether it's an AC crank sensor or a Hall effect. It's if there's a heat cup in it, of course, it will disable. Right. And actually, there's a few things we're going to show you in a moment that are related to that kind of thing. Uh, certain repairs that you make that you not be aware of where you have to do some relearns to avoid that problem. Uh, it's all about whether the ECM can trust the data. Right. And if for some reason the engineers to determine under certain conditions that the data is not going to be valid for, for test purposes, then that will disable that. Value. You need crank relearn, cam and crank sync. Yeah. I, I'd like to add, you know, we don't think of this day to day, but that's why you do a full vehicle scan. Because if you have a fuel sender or a fuel level error code in your dash, it may not run those monitors. Oh, it might that, suspend everything. Pierre brings up a good point. So if your fuel level send, sender is not sending the right information, well, you may have a full tank, but it thinks you don't. Could be. And if it's too low, well, you may not find a misfire. Always do a complete scan may not, of may the not vehicle. complete the monitors. Right. It thinks it's got less than it's supposed to yeah. have. And that's, and, again, that's what we were saying. The sensors don't necessarily have to tell the truth to the ECM, but the ECM doesn't know that. And, right. Well, it'll figure out eventually that something's wrong. If it knew exactly what was wrong, it wouldn't need us. Right? Exactly. So just spit out whatever what some of these people like to tell their, their parts buyers yeah. that, oh, yeah, you know, it's got that, so this is what you do to fix it. No, no, no. We all know that's not the way it is. Yeah. These aren't magic boxes. They give us the ECM gives us a parameter. Say, hey, I got a problem in this particular area, but they want us to. He wants us to do the, the final checkout and verification. Right. right? And I want to thank that whoever that individual. Yeah, I can't deal. see this far away, but whoever did do that and clarify it, thank you, because there are turnoffs that the computer does. I thought you were talking about the scan tool doing. I'm like, I never heard of it. But thank yeah. you again. Right. So now we're going to go in enhanced mode on this tool for this Jeep. Really nice feature. Automatic ID pops up, tells us exactly what I'm working on. Uh, gives me the VIN, odometer. Uh, could go ahead and add the license plate in there. This is where your customer uh, documentation is starting, right here. So once we have that all in there, we're going to hit the OK button and display the systems that are fitted. And again, as Pierre's mentioned a couple of times, I totally agree. 
even if I'm going in after a check engine light, I'm going to do a full system scan if that capability allows me to. Why? Because if there's something in there he's pointed out, maybe you've got low voltage codes, maybe you've got a, 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 a fuel sending and anything that might affect how the, <coughs> excuse me, the monitors run or the test capability of the ECM. I want to know that. But do you do visual inspection on your customer's car for safety? Do you check the tires, look at the brakes, check the oil level? Of course we do. That's part of what a professional does for their customer. But today's vehicles are becoming more and more electrical, electronic chassis, rolling computers. How do we know what's going on with those? We can't do a visual on them. Oh, yes, we can. It's called a full system scan. So that's one of the reasons I'm going to do that. And while Pete's doing that scan here, you know, oil, like he mentioned, too much oil, too little oil can cause some problems, especially with VVT systems. Variable valve timing is going to cause an issue. Now, look at this. Look at this scan. We're going through systems here on five, coming across. And when you look at that, well, we got some codes here already and got some tranny codes there, don't you? Yeah. Okay. So tranny codes can be a problem. Anti-lock brakes. And look at the systems that are good. So now you could tell this customer, hey, the airbag's okay. We, we see no codes there. The EPS, electronic power steering, which this has a big electric motor on, and it just you saved and, and that screenshot. You just, they, they just saved that record for us. Now, the Snap-on has a nice little feature. I can actually upload it to the cloud. Yeah. Or Snap-on cloud on my tool, and I can print that out for the customer. I can share it with them by text or email. And it's part of, and it's a permanent record, and I don't have to store the paper copies if I don't want to. We do this. We put Dropbox since it's a Windows-based system, and when we sit, hit save screen, it goes right into all our computers on the system. Cool. And there's other things like that you can do too. But look at this. You this got a radio more, problem. Our base hub, tire pressure monitor, mm -hmm. and by the way, legality is there with tire pressure monitor. This is why this became a law to go on the vehicle. TPMS, if you got an issue there, you got to tell them. And look at all these codes, generic and permanent. So mode 10, right? And you see 0A or codes in mode 3, you could see the difference. There. Yeah, and see which ones. Again, we discovered that because we went through our global OBD2. But this is just a nice feature because it's actually going to show it up for us you know, on the, on the platform. Here in the shop, we use this quite a bit. My guys will jump to this tool right away because it is complete does it easy and by the way why don't we go into a recess and relearn for a minute that's we a talked about point. that yeah Let's because watch that. what you're going to be seeing here tire size whoa change tire size replace oil right perform wheel alignment okay replace wheel alignment relearn clutch pedal replace evap where's the cam crank Re replace relearn camshaft position relearn crank position if you don't do that okay if you don't do that misfires may not come up on the right cylinder you may go oh i'm on cylinder five with a misfire no you're not it didn't relearn the actual firing no. order and in some cases you're going to have to perform that not just because you replaced the sensor, but because you corrected a misfire. That's right. And you've got to reteach the ECM what's good and what's not good. Right. So here's one a lot of guys don't know about that I think you shared with me. You know, in some of these models now, if you replace an oxygen sensor, you got to relearn the oxygen sensor. You bet. And you will find that in the Snap On tool. People always ask me, well, gee, did that really work? Yeah, we try it on a tool. If it doesn't, we keep a book here. And don't just complain about the tool manufacturer, but maybe if you send them an email and say, hey, I tried that and it didn't work and I had to do something else, okay? Yeah. Relearn idle air control motor, a biggie, by the way, especially on these Chrysler vehicles. We've done a bunch of those, okay? Replace the powertrain control module. These are all resets. Hold it, a great one. Reset, coming tight on this one. Reset the fuel trim. You see this one here? I'm going to pop on that. Come on. Come up. There you go. Now, this here, if you have a DTC, let's say P0171, lean condition, okay? Lean condition. Well, hold it. The reason why you got a lean condition, you may have a fuel pump that's bad. You may have some other issue causing that lean condition. 
When I fix it, does it know automatically? Because here's what I hear from a lot of techs. Ah, gee, I don't do that. I just drive the vehicle. Okay, you know that vehicle like this has 70-something thousand miles on it. If I had a lean condition and now the computer doesn't know that I fixed the problem, I now am getting the right amount of fuel to that vehicle, we're going to overfuel it, aren't we? I wouldn't even buy overfueling. It did not get that correction. It didn't see that. It still thinks you got that bad fuel pump in there. Now, the same with that oxygen sensor. When you have to actually relearn the O2 sensor, if you don't do it, you may ruin the O2, or you may get the P0420 issue. Yeah. Okay. So make sure you read the information. And when you have these relearns, this is super important. And is there a bulletin right there? Nothing is really related to the job. We'll go no, we back weren't. and see okay. that. But I these think, are all good things yeah. here. And, and and to what G pointed out, what's nice is that they're all accessible right from the main screen. You know, you're not hunting through a bunch of different menus to see what's there. I'm going to encourage you that if you're using this, go to that service request and functions menu right off the bat to see if there's anything there that might possibly re be related to the repair that you're making so that you don't oversee or miss that. You know, uh, like you said, with a, our system relearn for fuel trip, great example. You know, back in the old days, we disconnect the battery, we put the cables together, laid down to keep alive memory, and it would start from default. You can't do that today. You unplug the battery, you're going to reset all kinds of things that you don't want to reset. And right? even and even if you put the cable together without a one ohm 10 watt resistor, well, you may have just awked something in there. Yeah. So the proper procedure is bring down the capacitors in the computer slower. Now, one good thing here I want to do, this was on oil, just real quick. Do you want to load the Jeep Cherokee Laredo oil spec? So it's going to tell me this is a 3.6 motor, 6 quarts or 5.68, an API, American Petroleum Institute, SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers, 5W20 standard. So it tells me right away it is linked to the pro demand account. And we use this all the time because if it tells someone, hey, you know, you need synthetic. And they go, oh, no, no, don't put that in. We'll print this out and say, look, you have to put it in. It's a manufacturer's recommendation. And thank God we don't get too many crazy customers like that that don't want it. Now, someone may say, hey, gee, it says standard oil. Could I use a uh, full synthetic? And we go, yeah, if you want, it's, you know, better for the engine and stuff. But it's not required. That makes the difference. So go back. I can go back. Over here. Sorry. There okay. you go. So again, service resets right there in the beginning of the menu. Now we can go to individual systems. We're talking about um, engine uh, engine codes here. We did the, the code menu so far. I want to go now. I'm going to look at the data on the difference here. This one we saw in the OBD2. And hang, bit, hang on before you press. Okay. Here's what we were talking about before. Engine. EVAP, EGR, O2, throttle, ignition. If you had a problem with O2, why in the world are you going to go to engine? Yeah. There's going to be way too many PIDs here. You want to go right there. And that's more and more common. It isn't all in one uh, list, but sometimes you don't always have that option, right? Correct. So, yep. So we're going well, to let's go, to go engine. engine. Even if we go to engine, where do you see how, how much populates on this list? Oh, there's a big list. And if you have something that is basically telling you what the information should be like um oh what's that word i'm looking for um boy now my brain i want to bring that <laughs> it's basically giving you the space you. desired if you see the word desired desired idle that's going to tell you what the spec is desired um fuel injecting pulse width whatever it may be look for that that's the spec now i want to go back to what we did earlier Global OBD2, intake uh, air temperature, right? The key, key timed out. Oh, timed out. Hang on. Double, double didn't, pump. Didn't pay it. the light bill. All right, we'll get it back again. Come on, buddy. That's something you've got to watch out for is the key timing out. Some cars have different procedures for making that not happen, like yeah. clicking the seat belt or, or putting the brake on. Putting the brake got on, it? something like yeah. that. Leaving the light, the parking lights on. Correct. Those Pierre brings up a good point. So, you know, once you get to know certain vehicles, you could keep it alive, right?
But look at all this list. Look at all this info. Yeah, that's what I want to show right now. Again, we're still reading, what, 78 degrees, which is what we saw in the global OB2. Same tool. time. But remember what happened when we unplugged it? Remember what we saw as the data on the global OBD2 side? Minus 40, right? Well, let's see what it does when we unplug it now. So remember, we're on the same vehicle. Pete is going over to the car. Okay. And what happened here? Are we still seeing the same temperature? Look at the top of the screen. 71.59. But hold on. I'm seeing something here being graphed all the way on the bottom. Okay. But this didn't change, did it? Gentlemen and ladies, you know what this is? Or ladies and gentlemen? Oh, there's not the big circus out here or anything. Not Ringling Brothers, but you know what? This is not the circus or the zoo. This is called substituted value. They are substituting that temperature and this happens on many of these parameters. Why? We're not in generic. You know, when you get to the OBD2 final ruling, OBD2 states that you cannot substitute a value. Okay. Now, they kind of lied with one thing. That wasn't invented. Okay. And you could thank this one guy, Jack Tyler. May he rest in peace. I happen to have met him many times. He was an engineer, retired from SAE, lived out in California, got a shop and said, why are there so many connectors for different vehicles? He's the guy that made the standard for OBD2. That J standard is everything in J standards gives us one 16 cavity connector. Okay. And when you look at that, you're getting that information, but they're substituting the value. That's why Pete went over this in the beginning. We go with generic global OBD2 first, because they can't do that. Right. And the reason I'm considering, guys, if you were just scanning over the data in enhanced mode right off the get go, you'd have missed this. You'd have yep. missed this as a possible cause for your problem. Um, and, and that's why we want to go to global OBD2 first. Why is there substitute value? Well, again, the ECM can only make decisions based on the information that's being given. So when a sensor goes completely out, completely nuts, well, the engineer knows, oh, that, that can't happen. So you know what? If, you, if that happens, Plug this number in because that at least you can use to keep the car running somewhat okay until the customer can get it fixed. But again, I wanted to show that to you. We've talked about it before. Never had a chance to actually demonstrate it to you so you can actually see But let me give them another visual. So let's say you had a bad mass airflow sensor on this car. They could substitute the value. And even if you were graphing that sensor, it would look like you were racing it up and getting different grams of air throw. This doesn't use. This is a speed density system, this Jeep meaning it uses a map sensor. Even if we had the map sensor disconnected and you raced it up, it would go off APP, accelerated pedal position, and look like the map is really changing. It's not. It's substituting a value. So it's a very important part why you want to go into generic or global. Yep. Now, the other thing I want to point out, too, because Jerry pointed out about the graph, how it was changing, and it looked like a huge drop, didn't it? From 78 to 71, that's only a few degrees. So it looks huge on the graph. You want to make sure you know where your scaling is before you give a lot of credence uh -oh. to a huge change going on. Understand Thank you, Pete. where those, those parameters are. That scaling could throw you off. I've seen good techs get beat on that. All right. So we're going to go into engine again. And what I'm going to do now is go to code. And be back out a little bit more. There oh, you go. wanted to go to Coast? Yeah. All right. So there we go. Now, this is great. This thought. is where I want to go through as we kind of narrow, get and wind down to the end of our webcast tonight. Having the information at your resource, at your tips, I mean, fingertips, is you, you have it so much better today than we than we did. All those resources you can might want are, are already in there. And Snap On's been a leader in that for many, many years. And we're just going to show you an example. Let's just take the, the map sensor code that we were dealing with, and we're going to hit the diagnose button. Now, watch this. This is pretty cool. This, my friends, this is our, our sponsor. This is our fast track intelligent diagnostics. You mean it's smarter than you and I put right. together? Eh, probably. Well, it, it's got everything <laughs> that we talked about. First of all, any TSBs related to the issue are going to be highlighted on this screen. All right. Um, if you could pull that back up for me for a little bit, there we go. 
this is where I really wanted to kind of stress again. This is that statistical resource I told you about. The mileage and the common issues associated with the code that we're trying to work on. I want to stress again, this is not a shopping list, guys and gals. These are giving you some probabilities. But if you say, okay, the number oh, one on the, the hit parade is to replace, replace the, the plumbing plumb gasket. Oh, but Pete, to, to, 19 people said it. I can't do it. <laughs> and then it don't work and the customer gets mad. But I can go in, I can test and verify that I've got the same problem before I proceed. All right. Now, here's another great feature that they've included. Code-specific scanner data. Remember, we already got it subdivided into just the engine. Well, they're going to take it a step further. Oh. And they're going to pull up the PIDs that they know from statistical use. As many times as this has been done on this code, where the common PIDs are associated for that particular code. And and by the way, you want to know sometimes where to get this stuff. It's called data mining. Yeah, absolutely. So basically what they did here is they are, and you see how they just saved that screenshot? They are connecting like your tool is connected to the cloud. This also happens with OEMs. Look what they flagged. They gave you the map voltage out of whack and the grams mass airflow doesn't have one on here, but yeah. you know, there are air, there is air flowing through there. But right there, that gives you the, uh, come on, full screen. So you can see the difference in that voltage reading right there on that line. Yeah. But what I want to point and, and to, to the end of this, in fact, that out just a little bit. With this particular tracker now, to, to make this work the way it's supposed to work, they automatically will put these flags on the PIDs that are most relative to the problem that you're diagnosing. But to be effective, you, you don't want to start this up until the engine's gotten to a hot idle. It's got to reach normal operating temperature and be running, which our Jeep isn't. That's why it flagged it right away. So if it's running and that flag pops off, what's really nice is that at the very bottom on the timeline, it's a little red marker for that. And I can tap on that and automatically bring up the data that was recorded and logged the little flash you saw on the screen where it saved it in the records. It's all right there on the screen where we can go ahead and pop it up and populate the data and see what it was that changed. That's just going to help you with your diagnostics. Very powerful. All right. Another thing that you can do with them is, as we saw <clears throat> earlier on the OBD2, is you can go in and plug in your own flags for the data pids you want, just like we did earlier with the OBD2. All right. So we'll go back to the next thing they have on the list. Code specific functional tests and reset procedures. If there's any, I don't think there really is any here, but you can see we got intake manifold, uh, short running valve, uh, control state, and some other things that we might want to look at. In so terms of the, all the intake variable intake and intake yeah. phaser cleaning. If we had a code related to that, we have the memory <clears throat> reset procedures here, functional tests associated. All, all the, it's it's all right there at your fingertips. So in case you didn't know which one to pick. Snap-on has the right ones for you to pack. Yeah. Here's another one I love because it's tied into their, uh, their service information. If I want to test that map sensor, watch this. I get the component information. You want to know how it works? There you go. Tells you how it works. Tells you what the computer pinouts are. I mean, the connector pinouts are. What they go to. And what the voltage reading should be. Yeah, everything you want, right there, at your fingertips. If I want to do a test on it with my multimeter. Well, you know, the, the, the Snap-on has always had some of the best scopes in the business. Yeah. And so their tools From the got first the, vantage, it's yeah, all built in. Yeah, it's all built into the tool. So I can use that or the built-in multimeter. I have the test results I should get, get where to connect, and then I can even hit the little button, and I can activate the meter on the tool, perform the test, and see the test results. Pretty neat. So that's a really great feature. All right. Oh, out of range signal you had there, too. That they can show you, but it's pretty neat. Here's the other we talked about: sure track. These are verified fixes related to that that data, and there's other related fixes, uh, industry expert information. And that's really cool because that comes from you guys, yeah, who are on the community that are sharing what they've experienced in their own shops right there. So there's great information there. And then we have the OEM repair information. I, I'm sorry, I would love to show that to you, but I, I didn't have the login. I apologize for that. But you know. Their, their Mitchell one is part of their their family, right? And you know what kind of data that you can get there. So this is just great. All the information resources that you need is right there at the bottom. And and we use this on the unit we have here works great. So we have pro demand on our computers, but we also have it linked to our tool. Right. And you could do the same thing. It's not yeah. some special hocus pocus. 
really good stuff here. And um, I guess we're near to yet, close to the end. If yeah, no we got questions. a couple little things that we want to share with you. We'll come back over here. Give you a click. Oh, you got your clicker? There you go. Yeah, I'm a clicker. First of all, any questions, first of all? Um, or comments. Or comments, yeah, that you want to throw in there. Did you guys get you some some good info, you guys and gals, out of this? Hopefully a couple of and, helpful uh, tips. Stick around because we're not quite done yet. So I just want to throw that questions in there in our emails one more time. Make sure you get that information. Anything, Pierre, on questions or comments? Uh, no? Well, not really relevant. To come back and forth. Okay. That's all right. That's cool. If you do have one, come up later. That's where you can reach us. Yep. I um, want to say again, thanks to our sponsor, oh, yeah. Fast Track Intelligent Diagnostics from Snap-on. And I know we featured their stuff here at night and on their tool. Obviously, they're the sponsor. They're making this happen for us. But they're not alone in this endeavor. A lot of manufacturers are going to these type of, of, of resources available right there at your, at your fingertips. Right. And for real, we really use that in, in the shop. Oh, yeah, so yeah. All the time. You know, All besides other tools, but we do use the Snap-on tool every day. Yeah. Every single day. I um, want to throw out a little plug here for our upcoming training event on October 15th. We're going to be in Rosemont, Illinois for a day-long training conference at the, uh, um, was it the um, embassy, I think? Yeah, I think it's Embassy Suites. Yeah, it's all information on the website. You can see it at accelerate-conference.com. Um, now, if you get in before June 30th, it's only 150 bucks for this day-long event. Now, yep. I'm going to tell you what, guys. To see this man teach no, you don't want to for see 150 bucks you want to see him. is a value, <laughs> okay? I mean, in all seriousness, he's one of the uh, best trainers in the business, been a nationally known trainer for years, even before I met him. He's worth that money all by himself. I'm going to be there. Yeah. No, he's he's worth him. the money, too. But that's not it. You're going to get him, me, Scott Brown, of Scott Dag. Brown. Net. Oh, he's got man. some great stuff on these emerging technologies. Yeah, man. he's one smart really dude. Really want to see that. Good friend. And then our new technical editor, Brandon Steckler, he'll be there. Yeah, so that I a, that I know an article too. This is a <laughs> this is a forfer. Yeah, this is a forfer. So you get in before June thirtieth, man. One hundred fifty bucks. That's a deal. And, it, and that's not all you're gonna get for that right. money. TST code twenty twenty two to get that that discount. TST twenty twenty two. To get that 150. Get in the sooner the better you get in. Reserve your seat. And yes, you can shake hands with us, at least with me. I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> I'm not going to use one of those band things where you got to stay far away, you know? <laughs> but I'm all good with but, it. Will the Accelerate uh, celebration be online? Uh, no, this is only live. Got to be there. Got to be, be in there. it to win it. And there, I don't yes. believe they're recording it. That I, I don't know that, that I recall. Been made yet. Yeah. So you got to be there live. All right. So with that said, um, again, thanks so much for Thank hanging you. out with us tonight. We really appreciate it. We hope that you found that your time was well spent. So to that end, we do have one more favor we'd like to ask of you before you go. If you learned something tonight, if you're going to walk away or sit away or stagger away from here. <laughs> Hold it. We can't. We got to catch up if they're doing that. A little bit more than what you came <laughs> here with. Do us a favor. Type a Y in the chat and let us know. If uh, if you thought we missed the mark, then tell us. We know it's the only way we're going to get better and do these things for you. Yeah. Type an N in there. And while you're uh, giving us that feedback. Um, so why if we were good and if we sucked? Yeah. And that'll kind of that'll tell kind of us cover the spectrum there. And then, again, we're here for you. Yeah, I spent 30 odd years in the trenches. G still runs a successful shop. He's still getting his hands dirty. You know, we're, we know what it takes to make a living in this business. We know how hard it is to make a living in this business. Yeah. You need the training and information even now more than ever. And that's what we've always tried to do over the last decade plus that we've been offering this content to you. Uh, again, take advantage if you're new. A lot of you guys are new. Take advantage of the content you're going to find in that, that Motor Race training website that you're watching this on. Go to the TST Seminars page, um, both on YouTube and their website. Tons of resources there. Some great instructors over the years. More, more than you can, I mean, they'll keep you busy. If you want to watch videos, forget, forget the, the TikTok and the dances <laughs> and, and the kitty cat videos. You know, do you well, I do like favor. I do like those pussy cats. They're yeah, very well, nice. So spend your, I have a whole bunch of cats. <laughs> spend your time is going to feed your mind and, and expand your professional skills. 
check out those resources and see the comments again. Thanks so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And we do. Uh, with that said, y'all have a great night. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you again in July. Thank you so much. In session, right? You can leave that. Wait.